All right, let's do this. It's uh, one of these buttons. I think it's this one. All right, that one works. Hey there, friends. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it might be in your part of the world. Greetings, my excellent friend. It's so good to see you. My name is Jeff Fritz, and today, today is December 19th, 2023. We're going to write a little bit of code today. How you doing there, chat room? Uh, let me bring on the chat room. They're right over here. Hello, hello. We've got folks. We're broadcasting to Twitch and YouTube today, of course. Uh, let me say hello to Nightmare Joker, Xbox One Online, Warm Peas, hello. Chaotic Monkey, good morning to you. Yeah, things are going well. Um, getting a, a lot of stuff done around the house and some other things that needed to be done here before the holiday. Um, Xbox One says, found this intro music similar to music from the Iron Man 1 movie when Tony equipped that first suit he made. Is it? A little bit. A little bit. Um, oh, crap. That... Let me see. Did I just, like, completely screw up my levels? No. Okay, we're good. Um, how you doing there? Uh, uh, it's a C-sharp Titan. There we go. On YouTube. Greetings to you in Australia. Over there watching on YouTube. New hat? Yes. So this hat just arrived yesterday from our friend Fierce Kittens. I, I've always been a big fan of the movie Tron. And um, I was at Disney, uh, what was it, two weeks ago now? for the Dev Intersection Conference, and I just didn't have enough time to get into get into the parks, find my way around. I really, really wanted to go to uh, to Magic Kingdom, go on the Tron, the Tron roller coaster. Was not going to happen. Just I did not have enough time in town. So um, the Fierce Kittens was, was there also, and uh, she offered to run and pick up a couple things for me. She picked up a hat, T-shirt for me, Huge thanks to her and and uh, for picking that up for me and sending it off. Really appreciate it, and I really like the light cycles on that hat. Very very cool. Um, hello Jean Valjean, good to see you. Hello hello, that's coder two four six zero one to you. Harrison, how you doing there? Was you were able to ride it twice? It's awesome. Your wife and daughter rode it three times. Yeah yeah, I. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, won't be in 2024, but we'll figure it out. 2025. No, no, it's not. Hey, not bragging at all. It, good for you. That's awesome. Maybe 2025, maybe 2026. We'll get back there. We'll see. So 2024 is, is absolutely booked wall to wall because I've got two daughters taken off for college and I have no idea how I'm going to manage that. So let me get some music playing in the background here. Um, we'll go to the Stream Beats Synthwave playlist. And uh, speak of the devil, let's start this one. This is called Race. This is music that's DMCA free, royalty free. Listen to it wherever you'd like. Twitch, YouTube, doesn't matter. Check it out at streambeats.com. They've got all kinds of genres of music available for you out there. Um, big thanks to Harris Heller and his team of creators for putting this music together that we're listening to today. Um, so I started moving things in TagZap, the application we've been working on here on stream. I started moving things over to... Um, moving things over to Blazor. We ran into a little bit of an issue with some of our JavaScript. I think I've identified what the issue is there and, and we can kind of play with that a little bit and figure it out a little. <clears throat> so, um, we'll, we'll take a look at that. There might even be a better way to solve this than using JavaScript, but instead go and, and convert more of what was being done in JavaScript to, um, interactive web assembly components um when's the christmas stream friday friday we'll do the christmas stream and we'll we'll do our annual reading of twas the night before christmas and twas the night before die hard because die hard is a christmas movie <laughs> um the, the um every every year uh, 
un, until last year. Um, my wife's grandfather would call for she was the oldest of the grandchildren would call all the grandchildren and on Christmas Eve read twas the night before Christmas. Um, unfortunately, we we lost him shortly shortly after Christmas two years ago. Um, so it, it, and it's, it's something that I started when I started streaming here. Um, last stream before Christmas, we're going to read the night before Christmas. Yes, hey, Lois Jens. Just resubscribed for 25 months. Good afternoon, Fritz and chat. Good afternoon you to you. all having a wonderful day. We are. Thank you. Um, so we'll, um, it, it's something that I started when I started streaming, um, six years ago now um in 2017 and uh I, I continue to do it and and will will continue to last stream before christmas read the night before christmas and uh and and for fun read twas the night before die hard so you've been here for it every year hey robert tables it's been so much fun it it has been um there's a question there from zarfus let me let me put that up let me put that up on the screen and we can we can talk about this. I, the, right, this is part of the AMA and why you get you like tuning in here is because I'll answer questions like this. Do you find it unfair that C sharp is always coupled with front end responsibilities due to MVC? Even if you search for back end position, but Java is completely just a back end position. Um No, I don't think it's unfair at all, because I think what's happened is that the .NET team from the very beginning back in 2000 recognized that they wanted to make web deliver delivery of websites a feature of the .NET framework. So whether you were building with, at the time, Visual Basic and C Sharp, you could build websites. You could build and render HTML with it. So it's something that Quite literally, there are there are many teams at Microsoft that build the various components to the .NET ecosystem. And I, and I had a, a tweet about this that, that really caught fire over the weekend. .NET isn't just a programming language. It's an entire ecosystem of runtime, base class library, user interface frameworks, languages tools, debuggers that are all built to work together and in that first party set of tools and libraries that Microsoft builds and manages are designed to all work together very well. Third party tools and languages, there are folks on the Microsoft team that support those vendors, community members that build those extra things to tie it together. So... Uh, there's a .NET event later. There is. Um, sure. Yeah, it's okay listening. Um, so the the fact of the matter is, Java folks built their one user interface that could be deployed and run on any runtime, while the .NET folks built and said, well, we're going to give you, initially, Windows Forms, and web forms that you can build with. So they 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 literally had teams that were building the language, the runtime, the base class library, and then these two user interface frameworks. So they spent a lot of time getting all that set up. Yeah, there were Visual Basic websites, absolutely. So um, if the Java folks spent more time making JSP, Java servlets, what have you, more of a first-class citizen with the language and frameworks so that there was very productive web delivery. Yeah, I bet they would pick up some of that action. I mean, you're not wrong that, that it's not considered for building user interfaces for websites. You're right. There's something to be said, though, of if there was a Java native first party managed, it just isn't there. Like 
JSP and Java servlets kind of clumsy. So, um, yeah, .NET was initially positioned as a front-end system. Yep. So, um, you like to prank C-sharp developers sometimes by randomly writing a component in VB.NET. Nightmare Joker, that's just... That's just cruel. What'd you do? He wrote a little VB net in the middle of that thing. Um, how you doing there, Dr. Cox? Can we tell you get back into the problem you had in the last stream? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to absolutely dive into that. Um, and, and talk more about it. Um, KPI dolls. The fact that an established, well-known... Um, S4P0. <laughs> hey, S4P0. Thank you so much. For the sub, my gosh, is that a, a brand new subscri subscription? Thank you so much for that. And um, at tier one, and we're, we'll make a donation to the American Cancer Society, like we do with all of our subscriptions, cheers, and ad revenue. We make donations to the American Cancer Society. Thank you so much. I'm wearing Stark Industries today. Not wearing the Tron t-shirt. I wanna wait until I get the other set reconfigured setback up with the, the I've got a new mixing board we're going to install and we'll get we'll get that uh, up and running and be able to see t-shirts that I'm wearing again um, a KPI doll says the fact that an established and well-known Microsoft employee is wondering how he will manage two kids and two kids in college scare, scares the snot out of KPI dolls because being a no one and trying to make IT and programming doesn't know this hat and it's not going to recognize it oh my gosh S4P0 just gifted five subs. Five gift subs into the channel. Thank you very much. I'm going to make five donations to the American Cancer Society. Of course, our friends at Microsoft match my donations. Congratulations to Wheelchair Sean, Apricoot, Boom Boom, Don Stefan, and Dutch Thought. You just got gift subscriptions. Thank you so much, S4P0. Um, that my, my problem isn't so much managing the money. It's managing the time connecting and, and if they're at two different schools, managing, getting them back and forth and whatnot. That's, th that's gonna be the, the issue. So, you throw in a little PHP with Peach Pipe, well, geez. Um, the VB6 devs in the audience uh, gave VB.net a standing ovation for finally making VB a first class language way back then. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, from the PDC, the Professional Developer Conference. Uh, you're welcome, Zarfus. That's why, yeah, the AM, I believe the AMA tag is on, right? The AMA, yeah, that, right? So if you look just below on Twitch, there's an AMA tag, right? It, indicating you can ask me anything and I'll, I will pause and, and we'll chat. It uh, comes down to mostly React-based front-end app. So, Zarfus... <laughs> Um, the, the JavaScript framework wars that are going on right now between React, Vue, and HTMX folks is, uh, is funny. So C sharp is unusually hard to find. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I, I get it. As this new version of Blazor takes hold, I think it's going to change because there's so much, um, you can do with it so much flexibility that's really gonna light people up so uh let me see what else is going on here two, 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 two. there's all the subscriptions um yeah that was the history of of how dot net came around so um but yeah right now everything has got to use react and folks are getting frustrated and tired with of react Mythin, thank you so much for the resub. Mithin01 just resubscribed for 27 months. Hello there. Hello to you. Thank you so much, Mythin. And another donation I'll make to the American Cancer Society. Um, ask me anything? Yeah, what's my favorite curry? You know what? I don't, I don't really have a favorite curry. Hmm. Mom! Look, Mom's here. Hi, Mom. Look, Mom's right there. How you doing? Great to see you. Um, look at her with the dancing bottom oats. That's right. You, you like the hat? So our friend Fierce Kittens uh, picked this up at the Tron Light Cycle attraction 
at Disney. I really wanted to get over there, but just didn't have enough time. Like, I wasn't going to pay 200 bucks to get into, 150 bucks to get into the Magic Kingdom at Disney to be only be able to be there for an hour and not even get, be able to get on the ride. It's like, I, I can't justify that. So, um, couldn't get on and yeah, sometime in 2025, we'll get back. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll get back there. Um, so, uh, when framework kitties start fighting, yeah, just get the popcorn and giggle. Yeah. And, and our friend David Fowler, um, architect of, of, of the .NET ecosystem, he's, um, he, he's been stirring the pot a little bit with the C-sharp discussion recently. So, you're still waiting for JavaScript.net? That could totally be a thing. Because, right, JavaScript could compile and run on the, the base class runtime. Could be a thing. Um, it's hard to convince C-sharp developers to not use React. You're witnessing it now. There's too much FUD about Blazor. Really? Oh, folks saying that Blazor could be sunset. I, I will... I will stand by my statement. If you think that Microsoft is going to sunset a framework and just leave you stranded, not only not only did they continue to make a browser to support Silverlight for 10 years, but they supported and put security fixes and patches into Silverlight for 10 years. 10 years, man! 10! Like, ask AngularJS developers what they're up to. Ask folks, do you really trust Meta? Do you really trust Meta? Are they going to give you as a developer that kind of support? So, to say, you know what? Microsoft's not going to support your development framework. I think there's a long tracker record there that you might you might be a little surprised if you actually read it. Yeah, the hat is Tron. Yes, yes. It says uh, uh, live to right live to race, and then there's a Tron logo on the back. Um. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Hey, Surly. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, the unintentional links. Uh, yeah, the lines for the Tron ride are insane. You love the .NET Aspire stack, Zorfus. So, here's the thing with the .NET Aspire stack. You don't have to deploy a .NET app. You can use it to deploy other apps in containers. And it'll give you nice organization and references back and forth between those applications. Like... There's a whole orchestration story there that folks are going to learn and go, holy smokes, why are we even trying to do these other orchestration things? Because Aspire gives us a way to hook things together, configure, and organize them. That's really, really nice. And it's a real programming language. So we can build in all kinds of other configuration too. So, oh yeah, uh, we're gonna, after we get Tags app migrated to Blazor, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to aspire a fi I'm, I'm co coining that. Somebody, somebody get, get the, the dictionary people on the phone. Um, Fritz is coining aspire a fi Okay. Can we, can we make that a thing? And it's, it's, Right when when you go to put an application into .NET Aspire, you Aspire Aspireify it. Okay, I'm I'm coining that. That's that's going to be my thing. I want a nickel every time everybody says Aspire Aspireify. Okay, I, I don't know if that nickel thing is real. I heard somebody in Spider Man say that once, and I figured it would be good for me to try it. So, um, how you doing, Frank? Hello, hello. Yes, they do have a Tron ride at, at uh, in Orlando at Disney's Magic Kingdom. They also have it at Tokyo Disney. And, and it was there first because they didn't want to build Space Mountain, so they built Tron, uh, Light Cycle Escape. So, um, yeah, jscript.net. So, 
Yeah, the uh, Mike Arm decided to give out. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. yeah, now it would be now it would be architected much much differently. So, yeah, they tried to get JavaScript running with .NET 20, 23 years ago, and uh, so, um, yeah, backwards compatibility is something that Microsoft strives for. It, it's kind of baked into a bit of the direction that we have. So being able to have backwards compatibility means that you're you're never you're, you're never too far off from being able to upgrade easily. Never too far off. Angular is wild. You start on a project and when you're ready to deploy, there have been two ma new major versions. True, Nightmare Joker. That's right, containers, Robert Tables. You should see what you can do with containers in .NET Aspire. There's some really, really cool stuff there. ASP.NET Web Forms is still supported. Classic ASP, still supported. Yep. Yep, Aspirify.com. Let's, let's make that a thing. Those $10,000 AIX PowerPC uh, Risk 6000s were in some cases supported for 20 years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, another cool thing coming is Wazzy. Yes. Wazzy is going to be very interesting for folks. It's a little bit too abstract on some of the requirements right now. And it, and you won't, I don't think you're going to see a Microsoft product dedicated with full support to Wazzy until there is a concrete standard approved and out there. Um, it, it'll it'll be in experiment mode like Blazor was, which I think leads to a better product. So we'll see. Uh, we're not off to a good start. Domain name is not available. What? Domain name is not available. Stop the press. Hang on. Aspireify.net. Uh, Add to cart. Aspire a fi? A F Y? Yeah, aspireafi.com.net. Yeah, they're all available. Um <laughs> arguing logically with JavaScript developers uh, is not easy. I'm not gonna completely by that statement uh is it is it knowing my left um for example world peace well mm, mm. um ibm still supports their as 400s yes they do do i know much about the release schedule of, of aspire i do redux and i'm not allowed to talk about it um i can tell you that the team has been clear that they are they 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 are planning a 1.0 release in spring 2024. So, DGB switched from Vue to Blazor three years ago, and uh, Blazor's really great. Still confused with .NET 8 and render modes. I, DGB, I'm, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you there. The, the Blazor has entered the Spider-Man zone, where with great power comes great responsibility. With five different render modes for content. That's a lot. That's really confusing. We're going to get in there. And I want to get some of the feedback from some of you that might program more on other frameworks. As we look at lighting up more of, um, more of the Blazor capabilities here. You were going Aspire IFY. So I was saying AFY. Aspire FI with an I? Yeah, that's available also. Um, stand by. <laughs> Mom, I'm buying another website. Now I'm going to have to two-factor this, aren't I? Yeah, I need to do my two-factor. Hang on, I'm buying a website. I'm buying a website. Da, 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 da. 
There we go. And yes, I know it's not up on screen. I'm not going to put it up on screen because I'm buying a website. Do, 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 do. I, I keep changing the, the payment card on this and they, um, yeah, that one. No, let's just do this. Uh, continue. Yup. Do it. Nope, doesn't know this hat. And, and it probably won't because of the way the logo is. Here we go. I gotta wait for the two factor to tick over here. There it goes. Um, stand by. Transferring, processing the order. Got it. Aspirify.net is mine. Um, there we go. Um, yep. So, and I will be putting a blog up there with articles and content about migrating things to Aspire. Oh, yeah. We're going to have some fun with that. I got the domain. <laughs> Um, Manoj, I'm going to pin your question there. Eric started playing with Windows AI Studio last night. Yeah, I saw your message. Um, fantastic. I'm glad you're enjoying that. Um, <laughs> Glenn Condren and Fowler's video from .NET Conf. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, you just literally left out loud when you said you were buying that. Oh, yes, I bought a website. Mom, I bought a website. Paging mom. Mom. I, and I've got another website. Uh, how many do domains do I own? Stand by. Stand by. Dashboard. Why doesn't it show me account here? Domain list. Do, 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 do. See, there's not that many here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I own 11 websites. So I just added Aspireify into it. Uh, CsharpFritz.com, JeffreyFritz.com. I own Gamer Kitchen. Gamer.Kitchen. I own that one. If our if our friends LA Face and Joystick Nick are out there, I do have that one, and, and, we, and I know we want to do something with that one. Um, my tag was what TagZap started as, but it's turned into TagZap, and I own TagZap.net. I also own the Tamil domain name. I should get rid of that one. I don't, we're not working on Tamil. So, yeah, I, I've got a few. So, uh, I'm gonna, oh, oh, and I own Clip Talk. It's still out there. I'm gonna have to put that in the farm, in, in the footer. Mom approved. Yeah, there, I like that. Um, Surly Dev only owns four domains. We got, we got to work on that, buddy. That's, th those are, those are rookie numbers, okay? We need to we need to get you a little bit more in there. We need to level you up, stronger, more websites. Um. So yeah, Clip Talk is gone, um, and, and I need to finish re redirecting the domain name. It, it's just kind of broken out there. I tried getting it wired up to the blog, and it just won't go there. But yeah, Twitch basically. It basically took it down, so. Um, M. Pulowski. Pulowski just resubscribed for 43 months. Love keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'll make another donation to the American Cancer Society. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. So. Hey, y'all, Risky. Yeah, we're going to have a good day today. Uh, yep, I did get the domain. <laughs> Let me see here. 
Um, two days ago on Namecheap, you found that price for Telegram IO was twenty dollars, and it's two hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars now. Yeah, Gamer Dot Kitchen. That's right. No, where there's RGB LEDs all over the place, and it's really cool looking. Um, I got a chance to to tour the Gamer Kitchen uh, about two or three months ago, and uh, fantastic setup they have. Really nice. Um, do, 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 do. Let me see here. All right. Um, you have about seven to eight domains. Most redirect to a single one. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, let me back up and go to this question from Manoj. Can I talk a bit on debugging multi-threaded applications? Th this is not easy. It, it, as soon as, right, debugging single-threaded applications, folks have a hard time with following the process going through. When you think about what a website is, by its very nature, a website, a web server, is a multi-threaded application, right? Most websites operate on allocating a thread for each request, right? And then there, there's a queue that will build up of requests while the threads that it does have available are working to process requests and, and respond to folks that are visiting the website. So by its very nature, a website is a multi-threaded application. Okay. But, right, you can do things to go even further with background services that run on separate threads and, and other capabilities that you might set up to, to run things asynchronously, and then it becomes even trickier to manage. Debugging multi-threaded applications is where Visual Studio shines, okay? Because while you're in and you stop the debugger on a thread, right? It stops the entire process, but you can see what the other threads are, what they're doing, and you can get into them. Now, Andy's right over there on YouTube. Look, Andy is right. It's really tricky because your breakpoints are going to get hit multiple times because there's other threads that are coming in to those same runtime points. Try to boil down your application into smaller pieces so that it becomes easier to isolate exactly what's happening. When you have to debug and diagnose what's happening because things are happening concurrently gets really confusing to do and hard to manage. This is where having unit tests around those things that you are multi-threading becomes a little bit easier to get in there and understand what's happening. Because you won't have to debug because you've isolated it down to a small unit that while it might be running five times, dozens of times, hundreds of times concurrently, becomes a little bit easier to see exactly what it's doing. The, the contention that may occur, the read after write scenarios are very, very hard to diagnose when you're um, doing multi-threaded debugging. All right. I think I think I'm enjoying my coffee today let me tell you um, made a little bit of coffee put the peppermint mocha creamer in there mm. Mm. it's that time of year for for uh, for peppermint mocha so you guess Aspire is the way to start every new .NET web project right now no no I wouldn't I wouldn't go there uh, Umer no I, I would I would say that Aspire is going to help you when you have a distributed application. And, and quite frankly, many enterprise applications don't need to be um, multi-threaded, distributed, with lots of little microservices out there. If you are building for a distributed application architecture, yeah, it might make sense centralizing the delivery of those settings to multiple running application servers yeah that's going to be helpful you could do this before with uh with services like key vault 
but we'll we'll see. It's it's too early to confidently say that Aspire is what you should do to wrap every web-based application. It, it might become a better way to ensure that our web-based applications all end up with great tracing, logging, metrics collection, health management, um, and fantastic dashboards for us as developers. It might be. It, it's, it's very early to confidently say that. You might be right. You might be right. I'm not going to deny that, you know what? Running Aspire with a single application might be really, really cool and might make it really easy for us to manage and push us on the right track of generating great telemetry, right? Great logging, wiring up to things like Prometheus or Azure monitoring so that you can, you can see and have those capabilities for you, right? Being, and this is part of that opinionated part of, of what makes Aspire so interesting. It's pushing you down a set of good practices right from the get-go. And I don't think anybody's gonna argue that, you know what, yeah, we, we do want good tracing and metrics collection, logging, we want those things. So. Running distributed applications in your local development environment is hard. Yeah, that is a key quote. It is. It, it's hard. We'll get there. Um, Umer says, can uh, ask, can Aspire be thought of as what Next.js or to React.js? No. No. Think of Aspire... I, uh, Aspire is this... It, it is in, its cl in a class of its own. Aspire is in a place where it's somewhere between between a DevOps process. And I had a great conversation yesterday. Uh, we recorded a podcast yesterday with Jeffrey Palermo, his DevOps podcast. Um, the, I'll be on an episode that's being released next week. Um, Aspire fills somewhere between a DevOps process for, for deploying and managing resources for your application, as well as collecting data about that application and configuring and managing that application. It, it's, a, it's a very interesting middle ground that solves all of those problems. So it's right, and, and I think, and, and, and Umer, you're asking the right questions that I think <clears throat> are going to make it very interesting as this develops. And, and as we as an open source community, as customers, consumers of Aspire, start to work with it, I, I think you've got some interesting perspective there that as we bring in and say, you know what, let's, let's run a React.js application with some node microservices and configure and deploy it with Aspire. That gets very interesting because now we've got a series of JavaScript applications that are reading and configuring and loading up with Aspire. And we have our great developer dashboard that's going to have all that stuff configured and available for us, as well as the distributed tracing. That becomes very, very interesting to work with at that point. The, the ramp up time, right? The other thing that folks haven't really talked about, we, and I, I spoke to Space Shot the other night at philly.net about this. The ramp up time for new developers to get started, and, and to his quote right there, new developers building and working with your distributed application are gonna have an easier time getting started because it's going to be just go fetch the Aspire bits restore all these other linked repositories that might be involved or fetch and integrate um, your NPM packages, your NuGet packages, what have you, and then start off the Aspire app and boom, you're, you're off and running. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yazdi ran Ty at their company. You think we're switching to Aspire? Yeah, right. So Aspire is the natural evolution of Ty. Um, so... Vue.js is confidently deprecated? No, I wouldn't say that at all. No, I wouldn't say Vue.js is deprecated. No, there's folks working on that. Um, McNett's uh, built an ASP.NET app about 17 years ago. Whew. Haven't touched web development again. How difficult could be a migration to Blazor? It's going to be difficult. 
17 years ago, that means that you built that, I'm guessing, let's call it 2006. Um, which means you built it either with MVC or web forms. If you built it with MVC, you're going to be able to get into ASP.NET Core easier. If you build it with web forms, you're going to need to do a bit of a rewrite. Uh, Manoj asks, is Aspire like Docker Swarm, locally integrated with your IDE or local dev tools? No. Not quite. It, it has its own dev tools that it starts up and, and has available for you. Um, so, you'll... Should we run the? Should we do the Aspire demo real quick, and then we'll jump into Tags app. I can do the Aspire demo, and we can talk about that real quick. I think that's, I think that could be fun. Um, let me see. Uh, Amal on YouTube says having they were having difficulty debugging Dapper enabled applications and in Aspire. Yes, right. Th so now they've enabled Dapper, um, Dapper APIs in in Aspire and. It's becoming much, much easier. Um, sure. Yeah, let's do... All right, so let's do the Aspire demo. So this is... Uh, uh, let me head over to the to the code. We can dive into this. Hey, friends. Now I'm down here. Hello. Uh, oh, forgot to put on my gunners. Hang on. There we go. Um, so I'm just going to start up. This is Visual Studio 2022 Preview. You need the latest preview. This is 17.9 preview two. If you're watching the recording of this on YouTube, it's sometime in the future. Um, you need a version of Visual Studio 2022 17.9 or later. Okay. Um, I'm going to create a new project here. We'll take a look at the templates that pop up. Thank you so much. Look at that. There is a .NET Aspire starter application. We'll take a look at that. And uh, I'm going to give it the very creative name of Aspire App 2. And and let's let's dive in and talk about this. Yes, I want .NET 8. Let's turn on Redis for caching. Um, that requires Docker to be configured on your machine. I do have Docker Desktop running here. Um, but if you're you can everything that I'm doing here, you can do at the command line. You can do on uh, on Mac and on Linux. Um, if I open a command line, I can show you what that looks like real quick before I go through and we look at the code in, uh, in Visual Studio. Um, if, why, why are things running so slow? Thank you. Uh, if you run .NET workload, there is an Aspire workload that you can install. Workloads are the way that we deliver, or the way that we can deliver external tools and capabilities into .NET, into .NET at the command line that don't ship with the command line. This helps us keep .NET at the command line smaller, I won't say very small, but smaller, so that these optional things like the SDKs for Android, Mac OS, iOS, and Windows to build MAUI applications come in after the fact, because those, are, those SDKs are pretty big. So Aspire right now is a workload that you install separately. So, you would search for .NET Aspire, and you would add it um, with .NET Workload install, I think it is. So, uh, yeah, sure, go ahead, you can make changes. Really? I have a pending reboot? Okay. And, right, so it's installed me my list uh 23557 yeah that's the current version so um and you can then work with it you can use this to to build applications so oh look 17.9 here's all the cool things that are new yay um so let's take a look at what comes with the Aspire sample application, right? Now, this is just a sample showing what you can do. This is a preview, right? There's all kinds of things going on. Check it out, github.com slash .net. I'm even gonna put the link because the, the team is actively taking pull requests issues and they're adding features. They haven't deployed new capabilities yet. They haven't updated what's out there, 
on the on the release version but you can you can go download nightlies and tinker with them hey nova troop uh things are going well F folks have been asking about dotnet aspire so we're doing the demo real quick um by default it generates four projects for our application the big one down here uh aspnet asp i'm sorry Ooh. aspire app 2.web is an aspnet blazer application there we go and you'll see this looks like a a, bla a new blazer web application thanks copilot you can you can go away for a little bit here um but you see up here it, it does some things for aspire components this is the new bits being added into our dotnet application where it's going to add service defaults and to to the question we had there just a little bit ago from low viz we're going to add an output cache to something called cache. So we're going to set up a Redis output cache. All the rest of this is just garden variety ASP.NET. And if we look at if we look at our components, we look at pages, we can go over here to the weather, you can see there's an output cache attribute de decorated on this. This is the way we output cache things with Blazor. We add an attribute, we you can do this in MVC and Razor Pages also by actually using the attribute syntax. But we're saying this is a five second output cache that we're going to use so that we can um, so we can minimize the, the, the impact on this. Maxwell asks, do I wear a hat so the headphones don't dent my hair? No, I wear a hat because I like wearing hats. I have a, I have a very large hat collection and um, since I wear a different hat every day, it helps you identify if you've watched this video before when you look at the recordings. Say, so it doesn't know this hat yet. Boom, boom. Sorry. Um, okay, so that's what's configured in our ASP.NET application. But what's interesting here is this is going to use a weather API object to go get data. Let's go back to the program. And we can see it adds a weather API client. Our weather API client knows how to use an HTTP client to go fetch data for our weather forecast from somewhere, right? And it's going, it's going to go somewhere and it's going to fetch it and go to the slash weather forecast. Now, when we go back over to the program, you see that we're configuring that HTTP client to go to someplace called API service. There is no web domain called API service. I don't have anything configured on my local system called API service. Where is that coming from? And where is that coming from? And this is where we're starting to stitch together services with Aspire. Because Aspire has an app host that defines, here's the topology Here's the structure of our distributed application, and here's the things that we want to name and stitch together. Redux. Redux just resubscribed for seven months. Funny how this sub anniversary prompt didn't show up on mobile. Thank you so much. Um, it does. It, it's, it's kind of funny how it shows up, and I'll make another donation to the American Cancer Society. Inside this host project, you can see it references and it knows about the other projects. So it's adding a reference to the app two API service up here. And it's calling the output of that thing API service. Let's look at that. And that's that's an ASP.NET minimal API that is configuring an endpoint, a single endpoint called weather forecast. And it's just going to generate some random data that looks like a weather forecast. But if we go back to app host, it's connecting to that and it's saying wherever that thing is, other applications, other projects, other components managed by Aspire can identify and refer to that as API service. So we're, we're putting a, a name abstractly in front of this so that inside of our code we don't have to manage and juggle domain names it comes in in one place here is managed and deployed right from that location and we're adding 
the Aspire 2 web, that Blazor application that's down here, that ASP.NET Blazor application, we're going to call that web front end. And it's going to have a reference to the cache. So, right? That's how it knows where this thing is. And it's going to get a reference to that API service that we declared. So that's how it knows what this is. So now we've got a nice little bit of, of connection there between these two applications. And we've introduced a little bit of Redis caching using a container, using Redis in a container. Finally, there's this extensions bit over here that's going to set up defaults for all of our services that we configure so that they have open telemetry, health checks, service discovery capabilities, some HTTP client defaults so that if you're using .NET, you're going to get some resilience built in here and so that it knows how to do service discovery and go find those application endpoints that it's looking for. All right, you can see how OpenTelemetry is configured down here. There's even a little bit of code if you want to use Prometheus that's that's hidden down here, or if you want to use Azure Op Azure to, uh, Monitor, it's just commented out there. You can uncomment and turn that on. But for right now, we're going to deliver to a local dashboard that it delivers by default. And some other default endpoints here for health checks and to see if something's alive. Let's, uh, let's run this, John, and take a look. So I'm just going to run the app host project. Single entry point that launches the application, starts everything up, and connects everything. All right? So. So this is the app host starting. And you're going to see we get, we get a different message here. That's hiding a dark mode. It does have a dark mode. There is a light mode also, if you like that. I like dark mode. Um, so here are the two projects that it built and are managed out there. Here's where the source code is, and here's the endpoints. So that API service, right? This dashboard, I didn't build this. This comes free with Aspire. There's my weather forecast, and here's what it's generating. It, it's just some JSON here, and I've got it formatted nicely, so we can we can read it there, right? So that knows how to work, and I can go to my web front end, and it it's my Blazor application. Notice it's at localhost fifty forty seven, so it's not at the same place that the dashboard is. So we're running multiple services here, right? And, and these things just work. And I can go into my weather forecast, and there's the weather forecast. And that weather forecast is being output cached, right? I'm refreshing and I'm getting the same content. And there it is, I got new content. So output caching is in effect. I can take a look over here and I can see there's my cache container running. It's running the Redis latest container. I can see the environment variables that were sent into it. I can take a look at the logs that are being generated for it, and I can, if there's anything that might not appear correct in here, I can dive into it. But I've also got logs that are hanging out here for the API service. For the front end, you can see where it's making its requests and interacting back and forth. Um, and I can, right, I can see the structured logs from all of the servers going on here. But there's also traces we can look at. So, right, I could take a look here where we requested the weather. So we made a request to the weather front end. To the web front end, we went to the weather location and it rendered that content in 16.63 milliseconds. And then it went and made a request over to the API, and it took 59 milliseconds to get that. Pull that all together, and it delivered and rendered three milliseconds later. So I've got nice structure there, and I can even see all the specifics of those. Um, and we can even take a look at metrics of how these things are running. 
right? So I can see the active connections to the server, right? And I can watch this if I need to. And, and you can see it's, it's slowly growing there, um, right? And we can set up and put more content into here. So there's no active requests coming into that. So, right, if I click around a little bit, and now I'm starting, I'm starting to get some data. So I've got tracing, I've got metrics, all of this in the box, in the template, ready for you as you add capabilities to your application. So this is what I mean when I say, it's going to put you on the right path to create better logging, better metrics, have telemetry, tracing logs out of the box for you. Really, really nice. Redux asks, was it .NET Conf when they did a live demo of this and one of the ports just so happened to be in use? Yes. Yep. Uh, AppPost is the one that rules them all and diagnostics built in, asks Eric. Yes. Nothing, nothing additional, right? It's, right, it's what? It, it's 12 lines of code, but with the spaces in there, it's really, right, what? Two, three, four, five lines of code. Um, if you didn't wrap these. The extensions are really where all of the logging and telemetry are configured down here, the service extensions. And we can configure those appropriately as need be across our applications. The trace is exactly the same as trace and application insights in Azure. I uh, wonder, wonder how that happened, that they are so similar. So. just the beginning folks have added the ability so out of the box you can you can deploy this to azure at the command line folks have added capabilities to deploy to kubernetes to deploy to amazon there's more and more being built and being delivered there is it, how do we deploy this as a unit or individually deploy and wire up so you'll do an initial deploy as a entire unit and it will create the appropriate services for you. Later, what, what they want it to do is a diff and only deploy the updates to the things that have changed. So we're very early in the process. Documentation is being built and, and being tweaked and tuned. There are people that, that were very upset and saying, I can't, I can't adopt this. There's no documentation yet. We don't want you to adopt it yet. It's a preview. Take a look at it. Let us know what you think. What features is it missing? Come on. Come on. Like, there's one side that says, hey, do more things open source. There's another side that says, hey, don't show us anything until it's completely baked and we can use it. Well, which one is it? And trying to strike that balance is tricky because the one side of folks that say, hey, do everything open source is really upset that they didn't get notified about this earlier. We can't have everything. Um, yeah, nobody wants to use the, the short-term support uh, versions, but, but on this, they want to jump in and use it right now. Right now. What features is it missing documentation? Then help with the documentation. It's open source. The documentation is free for developers, anybody developers, to go out there and tweak. Developers, 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 go to developers. it. Programmers can be very entitled. Very entitled. And to that end, the, the, the teams at Microsoft who manage and work on open source projects are not going to share plans and directions on things until they're until they're particularly for things that could be a new product until they're convinced that either it's something we can experiment with and it's okay to walk away from or they're confident that it is going to be a product and they've reached a certain critical mass where it shows off and can do the things appropriately at a high level that we want. 
Um, is my course on the .NET YouTube channel still valid? Yes. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I want to re-record. Um, they don't want me um, putting more content on the .NET channel right now. Um, so, I'm probably going to record and deliver my own re-record, reinvention, update of some of that content on uh, on my own channel. Um, and that'll probably be coming in the spring. So, I've got a lot of time open. All right. Um, so, that's the... That's the elevator pitch for Aspire. We're getting there. Like I said, it's early in the process. Tinker with it. There's some really cool things that you can do with this that we're just at the beginning of. And, and I think you're going to be um, quite surprised and quite happy with what it can do as we get into this. So... Um, you can, of course, right, there are features here in Visual Studio for you to be able to say, add new project, and if I add another, sure, add another app down here, yep, that's fine, go ahead, right, if I wanted to put another one out here, I can right-click, and I can say, add .NET Aspire Orchestrator Support, um, and it came back, it said it's up to date, if I look at what's in the program here, it didn't add those features in there, right? And if we look over here, there's nothing added there. However, if we look up in app host, right? Nothing there either. It should have added. Where'd it go? Add. Yeah. .NET Aspire Orchestrator Project app host is up to date. So if I want to say add an Aspire component. Now I'm not going to go install any of the other components that are out there. Um, no, come on, do the filter. That's straight NuGet. There's filters here for other components that, that are available. Remastered for its content. That's right. You don't understand why they're pushing back on my content? They want to give other folks an opportunity. Um, Aspire is not a project template. Aspire is a framework for delivering and managing distributed applications. In an, an opinionated framework for distributing and managing. This is taking a little bit longer than I was hoping for it to load. Uh, you, go away. Um, it should have, it should have added down here. And I thought, yeah, there's the output caching. You don't really even need to do that. But it did add a reference to the service defaults. And I was hoping it would, it, and I don't know why it didn't add it. So... I'll do that myself. Um, but app host, yeah, see, it didn't. Um, project reference. I think you were you were going the right direction there. Blazor app one. App one CS proj should have added these I don't know why it didn't and um, up here we can add that builder add project projects blazer apple and uh, let's call this uh, blazer apple one um, sure let's let it know about those things isn't it formatting? Something's not working in Visual Studio. It's not even formatting my content. Yeah, it did have it on the project box. I wanted to show you you could add capability after. Um, uh, hey there, Junie Vonash. 
Juni underscore von underscore Esch just resubscribed for 34 months. Good morning, fashion coding with Fritz. What happens when you take a razor to blazer? And what happens? Is styled garment. Oh, jeez. Right with the, without the sleeves. I see where you're going there. Uh, no, it was not ticked by default. Um, how you doing, Juni? Good to see you. If I went and said file, add new project, and it went back to the WebAssembly app, um, it is ticked, but it didn't add it. Right? It it didn't. No, it didn't add it. I think there's something off in this version of Visual Studio. Because, like, go back to the app host. It doesn't know. Yeah, it doesn't know what it is. I, this is preview two that I installed, 79 preview two. The preview one, um, maybe restart it. Um, sure. Tell you what, I will restart it, and we'll take a look in there. Yep, that's what previews are for: finding the bugs. So, go restart it. Does Visual Studio use WPF or UWP? WPF. Visual Studio uses WPF. And that's why WPF got so much better. It's because Visual Studio needed those capabilities. So, um, but Visual Studio will not be a UWP application. Um, so now if I go down to here, and if we say orchestrator support, it says app host is up to date, but it's not referenced. Uh, really? Yeah, it's not referenced. Yeah. Right? That... Oh, come on. Really? Like, the ghost text was there. Do it. I hit tab and the wrong text completed. tab and it, it yeah um we're gonna we're gonna log that bug real quick here stamp sign in really really you you logged me out Pardon me, will I two-factor authenticate to log a bug? Like, holy smokes! Um... Um, GitHub Copilot does not uh, complete with the selected text. With the suggested text. When attempting to accept a suggestion from GitHub Copilot, um, the suggestion is ignored and uh, tag auto completion takes over. Um, Upgrade started. Uh, Seventeen nine preview one. Yep, record my actions. Let's go. Yeah, I know you're recording. Thank you. Recording. Tab. There you go. Now, nah, don't need a clip because I got the recording. Thank you, Nightmare Joker. Appreciate it. 
Do I know if Office 365 uses WPF or is it JavaScript based? <clears throat> um, Office 365 local applications, they're their <clears throat> own applications built with C++. Um, online, it's, uh, it's JavaScript based. You clipped it anyway? That's okay. Thank you. We can, we can share that in all the places here. Processing the recording. You'll be able to submit the report after processing it's done. Look at everything that it went and collected. So. And then we'll get into, we'll, we'll write all, let me, while that's finishing doing its thing, Blazor app two, Blazor app two, CS proj, right? Developers, so, developers, hey there, Mamasha. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. I'm gonna just copy this so that it adds Blazor app two. And if we start this now, right? So we, we basically added two other, two other front end apps. So we now have three front end applications. We'll start this. Right. Uh, there was no runtime pack for ASP.NET Core app. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. That might explain some of it because those were standalone. Those are standalone Blazor WebAssembly applications that have an index HTML. Interesting. All right, let's remove those. And I get why they wouldn't. Look at that, it removed them from the app host over here. Hmm. Okay, maybe that's why it didn't come through for us. Uh, so if I say add new project, let's just add an MVC application then. Uh, ah, Razor Pages, sure, that works. Right? Uh, yep, enlist in, in Aspire. Do, 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 do. Add, there, it added it. Yeah. And it did add it over here. Okay, so the WebAssembly applications, it didn't know how to start. Okay. So if I start that... Um, yeah, I, I did reference the same Blazor app twice. You're confused how Aspire fits into your workflow DevOps stuff? Let me show you. So now I've got, I've got two front-end services. I have my API service sitting out there still, right? And I can take a look and jump right into, here's the ASP.NET Razor Pages application. And there's the Blazor application. So one might be your back of office accounting system front end. One might be your front of office um, customer facing front end. And your API that services them both, there it is right there. So you're loading these all up together and managing them from one console Right, and we can see all the requests, right? So there, there's the new Razor Pages application logging the requests that have come through to it. Developers, 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 Justice221, developers, 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 thank you for the follow. Uh, would I load or could I load into their your Angular apps? Yes. So there's, there's work being done to allow folks to add other capabilities, but you can add a container application. So then you can connect into it and you can pass into it the environment variables that you need, right?
so that it knows how to configure and connect to the other things. So, right now we're talking. Now we can start to orchestrate and pull a bunch of these things together. And because it's a programming language that's configuring this and not a, a markup language. I'm looking at you, YAML. Now you've got full control over these things. And if you want to do interesting capabilities and things and test things in different scenarios and, and depending on where things are deployed, do different behaviors, you have that control and that capability because it's a complete programming language that you're working with. And you get all the great logs coming out of there too. So now we're talking. Lots more work being done on this. Lots more work being done on this. GitHubcom.net Aspire. All right. 19 bugs open right now. 276 issues. Folks are talking about 45 pull requests hanging out there. Add Kafka. Um, add with volume mount extension method to container resource classes so you can make sure that if you mount a container it has volumes on it makes sense add oracle database components initial integration of prometheus monitoring and grafana dashboards awesome um somebody else did volume mount for data as well so there's going to be something there Entity Framework Core MySQL components. So it becomes real easy to light up and and reference and pull stuff together. AWS DynamoDB local hosting components. Right? Uh, add error icons for exited resources on resource dashboard page. That's pretty cool. Local stack for developing AWS applications locally. Enhancement of the navigation menu. So, like, there's stuff coming here that's going to be really, really cool. It's coming. One thing that confused Nova Troop was the way they said that about the Azure link. Aspire is a complete local developer tool. There are then wire ups, APIs that you can use to deploy. Azure happens to be the first class, first one of them. Kubernetes is available. The Amazon folks are putting together an AWS one as well. Can you dynamically define what in code ice cream stick model? Now, help me out there. I'm missing context because things come and go here. Um, Regathian asks, when referencing a container app, can I specify a path to a Docker file? A path to a Docker file. So if we say builder, add container, no. No, it wants an image. So you would have to build, right as part of your application, you would have to build and deploy. Because, right, if you're adding a container, you're adding something that already exists. Right? It's already been built. It's already been deployed. It's sitting out there somewhere. Pull that thing in and get it started. Um, the builder add project. Can you dynamically define those? Um, the, the builder add capabilities here. Those are those are Aspire components are what we're calling them that folks are adding into their project. So um, let me stop this. In the Visual Studio gesture you would use would be add Aspire component. And it's going to go and find components out there. And looks like something's... Looks like something's not behaving well. Which 
It should be finding packages there. Oh, because uh, we <clears throat> they're pre-release. Um, Redis, RabbitMQ, Postgres, uh, output caching with Redis, Postgres with an Entity Framework Core, Azure Storage Blobs, Storage Queues, Data Tables, Key Vault, Distributed Caching with Redis. I have no idea who this person is. Goodbye. Um, SQL Server Hookup, Cosmos DB. So those, right, these are available now. More are being built and deployed. You wonder if Microsoft will add something like custom widget to Aspire so users can create custom tools and share with NuGet. Yeah, that, that's what they're doing now. Yeah. Do I know of any free Blazor component packs? Mud Blazor. Check out Mud Blazor. Kind of like old web services references. You got it. Yep, look at that. And Nova Troop chiming in on, on Mud Blazor. Um, you've really been enjoying Fluent UI for with Blazor. Yes, Fluent UI is another good one out there that the Microsoft folks manage. So, um, yeah, there you go. All right. Um, so that's all I want to get into about Aspire right now. Well, let's head back over here. Radzen has one. Uh, yeah, they do. You're right. Um, sure, go ahead and normalize that. Yeah, this is where we left off previously. Now, all right, so there's Aspire. Yep, all that's done. Uh, oh, did that finish? Looks good, submit. What happens next? I get nagged by uh, support. Oh, there's not enough information for us to fix this, please. Would be cool if Blazor Fluent UI stuff was added to the main Fluent UI page over. Um, they work together, so I don't know why it's not on there. <clears throat> um, I do. So... Uh, you're welcome, Frank. And as as we get TagZap migrated and completed, we're going to put TagZap into Aspire. And we're going to, for, for deployment, for cloud deployment, right? So TagZap is going to have several different deployment models. TagZap is the application we've been building, web-based application we've been building. Right now it builds as an ASP.NET Core application and gets compiled as a container but has several different databases it can connect to we're migrating the user interface to blazor and we're going to have several ways that you can then deploy and work with it blazor in a standalone container you configure and connect it to whatever data source you'd like whatever security interactions you'd like blazor deployed delivered as a an aspire application and lives at tagzap.net. So that's that's the one that Fritz manages. Blazor as a .NET MAUI hybrid application, standalone to run on Windows or Mac. And then we'll talk about adding a client administrative or moderator application for tagzap later. So am I going to do a complete Blazor component without JavaScript? That's one direction that I think we want to go. Sean asks, uh, can you do other Azure certificates if you haven't done fundamentals yet? I don't know the certification um, process there. I can't answer that. I'm sorry. Um, so... Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's dive in and... and talk about what's going on in here one thing you hate about the old web references was how it dynamically built the code but you couldn't have the reference dynamically you okay aspire isn't something you're going to dynamically add at deploy time ah, choose these things to add you're not going to dynamically do that 
you're going to be able to choose and and put some information in there to help it decide how to configure things. But you're not going to just dynamically say, you know what, I'd like a little bit of this. Mm, you might not be doing that. You might be able to do that, but I don't, I don't perceive that as something that you want to be able to do. Um, we've been building a little bit of UI state so that we can manage the floating header on top of the waterfall page that we're building for Tags app. So let me set up. I like to work here at the command line. So you felt like Blazor was designed to do away with JavaScript? Not entirely. Um, so let's jump over to Tags app. Yep, we're migrating. Um, I'm gonna set up another window down here. Um, and up here, let's actually split this. There it is. So that we can do some different things as we're watching and launching and running this. So um, I'm gonna drop into the source project and we're gonna go into tagzap.blazer. The other thing that we need to do is we need to also um, figure out how we're going to hook our how we're going to hook our playwright tests into the new Blazor application. Nova Troop asks, "Is Clip Talk dead?" Yes. Um, Twitch released released native features that competed directly with Clip Talk, and for the cost that I was spending for Clip Talk and not having any viewers, not worth it. If somebody wanted to pick up and sponsor and pay for Clip Talk as an educational exercise, sure. However, it's really expensive. So. Um, it, it's just the nature of managing a ton of data that's loading all the time literally all the time so that you you can't sleep on it you need to be constantly loading data um so let's uh let's dot net watch this we'll see what we currently have out here running in blazer and the idea that i wanted to to go with here is i feel like tag zap is going to be a mashup of some static site generation some server side manage generation, and then some web assembly. We're gonna pick and choose some of those pieces appropriately here. How much was I paying for the database on Azure for ClipTalk? I was running two databases in Mirror. Each one was, was holding about 50 gigabytes. Um, and I wasn't using a lot of power on them. So just between those two databases, I was spending two, three hundred dollars a month just on the database. So um, the the amount of processor is really more what was holding me back there. I, I could have stepped down and, and taken less processor for the same amount of disk space, but but it was I needed more processor because I needed to manage more indexes when you're managing tens of gigabytes and it costs you a hundred and 150 bucks a month that's not bad that's not bad at all but mirroring it and needing all of it and honestly if i wasn't hitting it every second loading data i could have backed off on it i could have backed off on the amount of processor used but that's not the way that a social media website works. You're running a DB with four V core instances paying $1,200 a month. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I was running 50 DTU on each of two database servers. And it was keeping up and doing quite well. Quite well. And I, I still had, it, at my current growth rate, I still had three years 
before I'd run out of space. Disk space. So, like, I was going to be okay disk space-wise, but I needed more processor because of how much I was hitting disk. Go ahead and try hosting it yourself and having enough processor to handle that much data. It's traveling and being indexed and re-indexed that frequently. You run a small Cosmos DB app for about six guys that runs a company about 12 gigs of data, about a dollar a month. Yeah. But your traffic is nowhere near having data loading every second from Twitch. So, yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. Running with, with 10, 25 DTU on a SQL database and being able to store hundreds of gigabytes for $20 a month is really cool. Is really cool. But if you need the processor, you need to start paying for it. SQL Server at burst with that much space is pretty darn good. It's pretty darn good. So... Uh, no, I did not host on Cosmos. We tried to, and it, it was going to be too much of a migration. I spent, in, in the lifetime of Clip Talk, I spent more than a year, all told, migrating databases. And that was the biggest waste of time. And, and it, that, that alone killed the momentum and growth of Clip, Clip Talk. I could have gotten a ton more built-in integrations and capabilities. If, I, Quite frankly, if I had just gone to SQL Server first. But instead, I tried to go El Cheapo and, and choose different architectures, different ways to run this. And instead of spending my time doing that, if I had gone right to SQL Server, I would have, I, I would have saved a ton of time. So... Um, so we're, I'm trying to get the waterfall page here <clears throat> working. So the waterfall page, we're going to have data coming in on the bottom here that's going to come in from the components. And because of the type of data for the various, um, right, heck, let's go to the NFL test. Um, right, Azure websites, net. Uh yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's not going to be working right now. No, it's right. Um, because there's stuff broken there. Um, how you doing there, Chris Jones? Hello. So there's going to be messages that fill this. And each one of those messages, in my opinion, should be a WebAssembly component. So that they render and deliver and paint really easy on the front end. The header up here, I think, the, we can turn that into a component and probably eliminate a lot of the JavaScript there. So we, we had this idea of saying, well, if there is a floating header for this page, then let's wrap and put floating header here and put the header inside of that. So Frank uh, says it's always easier to reflect after the fact, but you couldn't know. I couldn't know, but at the same time, I didn't trust my gut. I didn't trust my gut and I didn't do the research. So we learned the hard way and hopefully other folks learn um, from that failure. So, and I don't, I, I don't call clip talk a failure. Um, for what we wanted to do, we learned a lot. We learned a lot. Um, and I'm okay with that. So, man, these .NET YouTubers are now copying each other's content. Wow. Wow. No, that's not Frank Kruger. That's Frank, uh, Boucher. Uh, Frank Boucher. 
so. Um, even if it doesn't work out, there's always a lesson. Exactly. We learned a lot. Go ahead, screenshot my code. Go ahead. Here, let me help you out. Um... There you go. It's all on GitHub. Go ahead. I'll wait. I'm not like other live coders on this stream on this service who won't show you their source code, who will blur their screen while they're writing code because they want to protect intellectual property. You can see every single thing that I write here and I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it away and you can take it, run with it, try it, tinker with it, send a pull request, open an issue. Try it. How is the enterprise adoption of Blazor? It's going well. It's ramping up. Yeah. There, there's, there are other streamers that don't want you to see what they're the code they're writing and the code they're that they're writing you can't touch you can't look at more than what's on screen and even then they're not going to show you the entire project i want you to learn i want you to get gather something i want you to know that i'm getting ready to move tags app to its own organization and i've stood up a repository where we're going to build the public version website that's going to answer on tagzap.net. What's in it for you? Entertainment. That's what those folks say. Yeah. I w Look, if you want to learn, you want to check out everything that I'm doing, download and tinker with it. Yeah. In fact, one of the things that we're going to do both in all of the repositories actually that we're going to put out here. I'm going to put dev container files. I want you to be able to click over here, jump into a code space or download and run it in an isolated container on your machine, run on a tablet and tinker with this code and learn from it wherever you are, whatever system you're working on. You're on a Raspberry Pi. Fantastic. So, um, what thin doll add on? Uh, it sounds like I'm working on projects they are paid to make and making extra money from viewers while doing it. That's right, Redux. Some say you can edit GitHub actions on code spaces. Yes, you can. Um, all right. So, and the reason I'm okay with the, the NFL test site not running is because there's all kinds of configuration that isn't set up yet up there and that I, I stopped on because we're going to migrate the whole user interface anyway. You're right, I didn't set up a project command. Um, um, migrating tags app to laser with .NET 8. Um, more at, there you go. There's the project command and I will pin the message, the massage. There we go. Cool. Um, moving on. So this header in the, in the finished version of the application floats on the waterfall page, right? So that we can show it and hide it. So where I started putting this component in here to say, oh, if it's a floating header on this page, make it a floating header. Well, let's um, let's turn that into a. I think I want to turn it into a server side component. Yeah, we do have interactive server components here. <laughs> um, good, 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 good. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a floating header component. Hey, gosh, that should probably be WebAssembly side, shouldn't it? Um, all right, fine. Components, add Razor component, and let's call this a floating header. And what I'm gonna do is, quite frankly, right, I'm going, I'm going to put inside here all the content to um, have this run natively on the client. On YouTube, hey Quantum, uh, you heard about Wazi. Make a comparison between Wazi versus Docker. Why people try to mention Wazi as an alternative to Docker in the future. Um, I'll answer this question and then I'm going to hold on on more questions. Um, we'll get them pinned over into feature chat because I want to focus on a bit of the code. Um, Wazi is a way for for us to build applications that target a common runtime that can then run anywhere. doesn't matter what programming language you're using. Just like WebAssembly, you can target and build and deploy on the WebAssembly runtime. The idea with WASI is you now have interop. So you can build an application and have it target WASI in .NET. And it can reference and consume and work with other WASI components and applications because it has a standard interface between those applications. So consider you could build an ASP.NET Core application that instead of targeting and running on the .NET runtime, runs on the WASI runtime. And you could bring in and consume a Rust component that is built and targets the WASI runtime. Now it doesn't matter what programming language you work, you work with. As long as you build and target that standard runtime, just like Docker, <clears throat> you can package and deploy these things and they work together. Docker, you build an application and you put it in a container and it has a piece of an operating system that it's working with. And it's a standard definition of what that looks like, but you still need to build an application that runs inside that container. Same thing with WASI. Instead of building and targeting a piece of an operating system, you're building and targeting a shared runtime experience. And when you build and target that, now you can compare and interoperate between all of those. Um, the streams are relaxing to you. Yes, I have heard that from folks evergreen. Um, if you don't code yourself, that's okay. That's okay. And right, they ask, they ask me anything um, tags are on because if there is something you want to learn more about, happy to take those questions. Or even if you just want to ask me questions about, you know, whatever. Hey, did you did you see the Wonka movie yet? No, I haven't. My daughter did. She liked it. Um, right? Yeah, gosh, you're, you're going to be in Atlanta for the the Peach Bowl. Any chance we, we could... I don't know. But yeah, I'll be in Atlanta. Um, is it next weekend? Next weekend? Yeah, next weekend. I'll be in Atlanta for the Peach Bowl. So, not a problem, Quantum. Hope you're having a fantastic morning, afternoon, whatever time it might be where you are. Um, they should totally get the Blazor Hybrid people with the WebView 2 PWA folks. Totally agree. Totally agree, Deflux. Let me work on, let's work on this header component here. So, I have this idea of a floating header, but I've already got a header over here that is um, all the things for the application. But can I? I can't reference that component from my client component, can I? Because this doesn't have a reference. No, it doesn't have a reference to the other project. It's the other way. The server side project has references over there. So how do I take that header and share it between the two? Well, well, well. 
Um, I'm done with my coffee. Oh. Um, gosh. I mean, I could copy paste, but that's going to be annoying. You know? Um, and eventually I'm going to need to do authentication inside of this. So where do I put that? Um, oh, that's going to get annoying. We're going to have to learn that authentication bit quick. Um, gosh, we're two hours in and I finally got to the code. Um, huh. Yeah, I'd really like that floating header to be a server side component. Let's move it up there. Sure, we'll put it in layout. Uh, yeah, go ahead, save the uncommitted changes, move it over there. And uh, we'll delete this one. Or did it, did it move it? No, it didn't move it, it just copied it. Uh, yes, I know, thank you. So, right, eventually what I'm gonna do in here is just call header. Right, and header's gonna have all these things in it and we're just gonna include that. Um, no. Render mode. Interactive. No. Interactive server. Thank you. Right? Yeah. Because down here, render mode interactive auto for the actual waterfall page. So interactive server, we'll put the header. And when we did the interactive, right, the floating header, we had all this JavaScript that handled it. So let's put this around that. Yeah, I know you don't know what that is. Thanks so much. And it just brought in the partial of the header. So yeah, time to focus. That's right. That's right. So, and then we had all this JavaScript that decided how to do the interactions with the header. And I think we can probably turn this into C-sharp. Hey, Speedy. Hello. All right. So let's say, uh, let's put some code down here. So... That's pretty interesting, but I don't want that. Um, I don't need to inject the UI state because um, that's being handled in the layout, whether or not it's gonna show that. So I'm out and I'll be able to change this to just say floating header, right? So I'm, I'm moving that out and all of this stuff down here, I'm gonna get rid of. Um, I do need the uninitialized bits. Let's see. Uh, go ahead. You can restart. So now we're going to bounce a little bit back and forth. Okay. And let's inspect. So... container so it did turn on and and render the floating header tag doesn't know how to float yet but it's there next steps so the idea is on the waterfall view you don't see the navigation bar we're gonna hide that by default um so that's a comment i don't really care about that um, it's going to get element by ID, header button, and add an event listener. Well, where did header button come from? Because I don't see that. Is it in the header itself? Did I do that? Mm, no. No. 
Okay. Hmm. All right. I'm intrigued. Where is it? All right. Um, you're coming with me. Oh. Oh. I should be able to use the on mouse enter and on mouse leave, yes. This is on the actual. Hmm. Okay. This is on the actual waterfall header coming in on the waterfall page. All right, so hang on. We're gonna end up needing something like this. What do you mean you don't know what HTML is? I mean, yeah, there is no... Um... Um, we're going to need application configuration. Yeah, I was right. On initialize. Yeah, give me the on async one. To do get the app config. Sure. For right now. No. Uh, yeah. Oh, that needs to be converted from Markdown to HTML. Convert markdown to HTML. Really? Uh, no. Sure. I don't like that. That's better. Do I really want to ship Mark Dig? It's not terrible. Um, well, in other places I have Mark Dig installed. Um, there, manage new get packages. No. Um, yep. Don't mind if I do. Really? Thank you. And... No. Y you're not even letting me choose. Okay. Now, why doesn't it know what H... Really?
I forget what the blazer command is to do HTML raw. It's different. Markup string. Thank you. Okay, so then I've got my header button here. Um, okay. But I need to reference, I'm, I'm referencing and pulling that elsewhere. Oh, this is gonna be tricksy. Binber. Binber18 just resubscribed for 31 months. Thank you so much. 31 months with us and I'll make another donation to the American Cancer Society. Um, so there's that button there. And I want to... Stop it. I want to make it so that when you... When you click on it, it will scroll in the content. So here's what I'm going to do. So this is sitting inside of uh, here and it's being referenced here. Oh man. Oh, this is going to be good. Um, okay. Uh, right, this is going to be the floating header. Yeah, something like that. And... public event callback um sure so I've got a parameter <laughs> I've got a parameter inside of a WebAssembly component that I'm going to wire up over here that's going to know how to show that content. Oh, baby. Um, do I really need floating header then? No, I don't. I don't. Right. Right, because I can do that. Right, and, and this is all a bit of, we're learning this new world of crisscrossing all the way between the different render models. So there's my floating header, and I'm gonna pass into This is down in here. Um, hmm. Drawing lines in my head between the various the various components here. Let me get rid of that. For right now I don't need the footer um, and we started writing a floating header JS this I think is gonna end up going away I'm gonna leave it open for right now just because I don't know if I'm ready to get rid of it yet um,
so... Thinking here. Um... Right, because the waterfall is actually coming from down here. Hmm. How do we do this? Right, and this one has the floating header click. I think I need to bring that header back up into the layout page. Yeah, I do. I'm going to take this out, which means this I'm going to take out as well, as well as the app configuration. Beca right, because this is inside of, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to walk these up because they are part of the layout here. So we have the header, and before it renders the body... See, this feels weird to have here also. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. I'm gonna move it into here for the for the header content. Um, and I'm going to capture. This is so confusing to think through. So I'm capturing the application configuration, which we're eventually going to have injected. And waterfall header content. Um, yes, give me that. Yes. And we're going to add this also. Yes. The other thing is then that mark that mark dig configuration that I put over here, I don't need in the WebAssembly. So that's one less thing I'm shipping to WebAssembly. And I could put that instead in the server. And so what, it stays on the server, right? Um, let's move these out. Yeah. Remove that, those. That's ah, nice and tidy. Nice and tidy. Uh, okay. So, good. That went away. And now it knows how to do that piece. Hey, FK. Yeah, check out that hat. Right? Look, look, look at that. So cool. I, I, w I was such a big fan of Tron as a kid, and it really got me started down the path of of thinking about and, and appreciating and getting into tech. And um, I, I really wanted to get over to that Tron ride, but our friend Fierce Kitten's there. Picked up a hat. I've got a t-shirt here. Thank you so much, my friend. It, I, it means a lot to me. Holy smokes, and five years! Kittens, five! Subscribed for 60 months. Also five years. Deep. Right? And I'll make another donation to the American Cancer Society, like I do with all of our cheers, all of our subscriptions, um, all of our ad revenue. I'm I'm donating through the end of the year to the American Cancer Society. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um. So. All right. So if I'm in right, this is where it's it's tricky trying to figure out how to move some of these pieces around by. Right, it, because I have Blazor living both on the server and in the browser, trying to control and decide where these pieces live. In this, it's weird. Um, I need app can so I do have app config, and I'm able. I should be able to inject it. Let me just say this is a new one of these, just for right now, so that I have an application configuration. 
that should, what are we missing here? Um, right, let's clear that out of the WebAssembly bits, right? Because these things don't exist anymore. Okay, from WebAssembly, okay. So we're gonna render the header and then down here in the body, I think we can now make the body entirely the power. Yes, much, much power. Um, it, and friends, if you haven't seen some of the really cool things that, that Fierce Kittens is doing with um, 3D printers, with laser cutters, you've got to check them out on her YouTube channel. She has been going to town with all kinds of really neat things. I, I saw a, a votive, uh, right? A votive candle display that, that you released a video on the other day. That looks so awesome. And you're able to make that from a laser cutter. So cool. Right? And it's it's just like printing at this point. Like, really, really cool stuff that you're able to do from that. Um, I don't think I need this one now. So I'm just going to yank that out. If I go over here, can I do that? And can I do layout? Can I do that? No, it doesn't know what it is. Because the layout doesn't exist inside this assembly. Hey, lanky Scottish nerd. Hello. Welcome. So how do I change the, how do I specify the layout? to something different. Right? I, I, I do need that intermediary, don't I? Because I can't change layout on the fly. Dynamically change it. No, I do. Which, do I even then, right? So if I put this up here, I don't need that. Um, that should. Calling the JavaScript. <clears throat> okay. So I've got it all the way into the WebAssembly bits. No, that from WebAssembly isn't coming in from there. Something's not working, right? Where is that? <gasps> Who dad? Crows! Crows 4K just resubscribed for 63 months. Pog pushing for six years. Thank you so much. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, 63 months with us. And I'll make another donation to the American Cancer Society. Thank you so much. Uh, it's got to be there somewhere. No. Yeah, that thing's deleted. It... Um, it's running in auto mode, so I wonder if it's... If it's not quite rebuilt... Hey there, chest noob. What is Blazor? Blazor is a user interface framework that allows us, it allows, it's a tool that allows us to build web pages that run either in the browser, on the server, or some combination. And we're confusing ourselves trying to build and do some of that right now. Um, is, is this happening because it's, it's in storage? Like, what is it telling me there it's not found? Yeah, those things, those CSS bits aren't deployed yet. Um, so let me go over here. Let's take this and delete all the things in storage. Yeah. Um... No, 
No. Where's it getting? That's the old content that was there. Oh, but I am getting this. I am getting my button. That didn't sound right. That didn't sound right. Um. Yeah, why? All right, let's. I'm going to keep wandering down this because the actual WebAssembly content I'm not as interested in as... It's not even this page. It's the layout here and getting that bit working. So, I don't even... Right? I can add that as a method, the floating header click. Uh, hey, you, we don't need, we don't need that method. Um, so I can say void that, wait a sec, oh, come on. No, um, already contains, it already does, it does, don't need that anymore. We're not updating this. But instead, so I already have a click. And when it clicks, we're going to set timeout and add a CSS class. I don't have to do a set timeout here. I can do this right. I can do this with some. I don't want to cut it. Let's leave it there. Right, I can do this with straight C sharp. So I don't need to do window set timeout. I can do <laughs> uh, I can do task dot run. Right. Um, and oh, look at that! It even added the async for me. Nice. Await task delay. Um, let's do this a little bit more descriptive. From seconds, three. <sighs> and then we're going to do something like this. I don't know what exactly, but that's the JavaScript for it. And we're going to add a, add to the CSS class. Um, we don't. We're going to do that somewhere down here. Ooh, ooh, I got it. Um, that's that's not right. Let's add a <clears throat> private string floating header CSS class. Uh, no. So then, right here, it was doing a class add, wasn't it? It was. It didn't remove it. Okay, so let's start this with scroll out and then do like that. Right now, what what don't you like here? What What is your problem? Am I missing a closing? I am. Right, so that's with that method. Right? Am I missing? Am I missing a curly brace? I might be missing a curly brace. That's good. Task run. Oh. Building. <clears throat> Should you practice your data structure and algorithm interview in C sharp? Or stick to Java. If you know Java, go with Java.
Yeah. Depends on what the job asks for. Duh. That doesn't look like it's actually running it. Hmm. Let's see where that goes. It's not writing it down there. It's not writing it over there. <clears throat> I... Oh boy. Why doesn't it like that? When used on a component. Uh, what, do you, what do you think this thing is? Rebuild that, John. Yeah. Okay. Um... get it to stream this part? No. Um. Shoot. Job asked for .NET MVC. Uh, then you're going to need to be on C Sharp. Yeah, you're going to be on .NET Core. Uh, yeah. Um, Right, so what I'm seeing is the layout. I want the layout to be a little bit more interactive. I can't do that with the layout. I have to do it with the components inside of it. In which case, I already have this to act as an intermediary that hands off to that. So maybe I do render mode over here of interactive server and pull these pieces that wrap the body into that waterfall page and let that do it. I don't need the JavaScript run uh, injected here. Don't need that. Right, so if I go all the way down to here and we just we put that and on the other side of this put that in there I need to bring all the code stuff with me now Um, UI state. I was just newing up there, so I don't need it here. Um, that doesn't need to be called. Don't need that. Let's 
So if we have UI state, and it always will be, uh, floating header equals true. Right, I could just do that and get rid of this. Hey there, uh, Castires, welcome. Hey, workman. You've been hiring developers for years, never done a code test as part of the process? Okay, cool. That's interesting. Because I, I ran into issues where hiring engineers, I had so many folks come in the door that we wanted to hire, and so many of them just didn't know at the time I was interviewing folks for a, a little dot com in 2001. Um, the folks didn't know basic HTML. Like, give me some basic HTML. Show me that you know basic HTML, and then we'll continue this discussion. Nah, that didn't go over well. Um, no, that's fine. Save that. The header component, it should find because it's in... Uh, can I just say layout dot? Sure, that's fine. Right, okay. Um, let's see what that does. I don't know. Building? There we go, from WebAssembly, that's another line. There it is. So, okay. I'm getting somewhere here, right? And it does have the floating header wrap on it. Okay, so if I click this, yeah! It did add the scroll into it. Good. Good. Next steps. Um, so if you left it or if you clicked or if you clicked on the floating header element. we would remove the scroll in. I don't think I need to remove it because you're gonna navigate if you're clicking it. But the mouse leave, I think we can definitely uh, on mouse leave, right? And let's add a method here, uh, on mouse leave header. Uh, yeah, right, uh, sure, that looks good. Um, yeah, we can do that. So now I've got on mouse leave header. So I can decide what to do with this. Um, if, um, If that contains, right? What? Then we know that it's scrolled in. Uh, we're going to remove it. But it's only going to enable that after three seconds. So let's add another one up here. Another private bool uh, enable header scroll out. OK. 
Okay. So equals uh, true. So it shuts it off. Rebuilding. Okay. Mm -hmm. Scroll out. Okay. So it's scrolled in. And now I mouse out. And nothing. Oh no, it did go away. Yeah, there it goes. Why am I migrating from Razor to Blazer? Because we're going to make it more portable. And I believe that it's my belief that we're going to be able to take advantage of some of the newer Blazer capabilities in interesting ways with Tags app. So. Um, okay. So we're probably going to end up having to tune that a little bit. Hey, look. Clicked. It's capturing it on the server side because I made this a server page. Okay. Um, so that header should be scrolled out. And I don't want to see the console. Stop showing me the console. No. There it is. Okay, so it doesn't have the CSS style sheet yet with that stuff. Okay. Um, small world, right? Everybody hangs out in Fritz's stream. Something like that. Um, so if we go back to waterfall layout, well, and that inherits from app which should be bringing in CSS site CSS. Which doesn't have scroll out. The plot thickens. Where's scroll out at? No. There it is. <laughs> um, sure. I'll even take that. We're going to create a little isolated CSS for the waterfall page. No, it won't. Darn it. Um, back up here. I'm in the. I'm confusing myself here. So I want. Hang on. I want it over here. Okay, we're going to get this right. Waterfall Razor CSS. So now it knows what that is. Rebuild. There's floating header.
think I should have picked up and redeployed. That's a lot of caffeine that Finland is consuming. There it went. Did you see it? It scrolled off. And if I click, yeah, yeah. And if I mouse away, dude. Okay. So Dr. Cox was asking, well, are you going to turn this into a, into a Blazor component? That was all JavaScript that we've turned into C Sharp now. Nice. Oh, I like it. So where'd that on that clicked button? Uh, yeah, we can get rid of you. We don't need that. Okay. And I, I could turn that into its own component. I would still need to pass that click handler back and forth. But I honestly, that's like the only thing <clears throat> that's going on on this page, you know? Um, I, it sounds stupid, but that was a big thing to get working. Um, okay. I'm going to commit those changes because I can. Um, yep, we're going to add, let's just add everything in the Blazor project, you know? Goot? No. Um, got the floating header working. Push that up. You wonder how well it would work on mobile? Uh, see, now the menu is is hiding under that button. And, yeah, that's... So, this part of the site isn't intended to be worked on, to be used from mobile. Um, so, however... At some point, there's a moderation view of this that's coming that, that particularly our friend Maddie Montequila, she was saying she'd love to have this view on her tablet. So we'll figure it out eventually. But um, if, if this was on a tablet view, right? So... Yeah, you know what? There's where the, the click operation was. Um, and it was in here. Uh, click header. Go ahead, generate that. And we want to do basically the same thing as up here. Um, you know what? I can call the same thing. Right, so here I am on iPad mode. Uh, Why didn't it hide the top? Hang on. Make sure that it's working. I didn't change anything over there. Um, oh no. Is it?
What have I done? Rebuild. Don't hot reload. Rebuild. And that brings it in. And if I put that back in there. Okay. Um, and if we turn this into an iPad, touch over there. touch one of those and it goes away but yeah there's no way to clear out the menu bar because you're it does contain scrolling and it does contain that if it's picking up the event. It picked it up because I clicked the button. No, it's not picking up that click in there. not on that one no no it's not on that one it's on the header there it goes and then click in the header and it goes away got it Um, corrected, uh, hang on. And let's rename this to on hide floating header. Uh, right. Hide floating header. Yep, we're good. Um, corrected hiding at a floating header for mobile. And I'm not as much concerned about the um, phone as I am the tablet. Um, okay. So what if, all right, so this is the waterfall from the pages and this is where we're going to start actually wiring up and rendering content and where we need an actual message item component. And this is where, oh, this is where we're going to get, where we're going to get a little bit nutty here. Um, because we're going to wire up SignalR Hub and push in and generate these components on the fly as, as there's new content. Never tried creating a... No, we have. We have. Right? We can do this. So, let me take this back to, uh, okay. And I 
wasn't there Yeah, the container goes wall to wall. Max width 100%, waterfall header, and then the actual waterfall page itself, which will have the pause updates button, the tagged content. So, Let's start moving some of this over. Um, I can put page title on this one. Right? Um, tags app, waterfall display. Good. Um, don't need that, don't need that. So now I'm gonna start adding in and that content modal is gonna come up here in just a little bit. So here we are in the web assembly. We're gonna start dropping in components. I thought I had footer fade there also. You, you're coming with me. The modal, sure. And then, this masonry layout is gonna be big for us. Yeah. Um, and that's the back of the modal. Let's save that for right now and see what we get. All right, so my pause button is appearing properly with the uh, with the mouse over and the fade out at the bottom you can't really tell but it's there okay okay and it still says from WebAssembly so we're getting we're getting the big pieces in here next steps start setting up that um, signal R hub so that it's fetching messages and passing them through. No, not even. Let's take the, the JavaScript that is putting together and assembling. And this was one of the first things that I looked at and was worried about. As we started building, I was like, oh man, the formatting of the message There is so much logic going on in formatting and displaying this that these are components. Like this bit of JavaScript right here is a component. So, right, I'm gonna jump into here. And this is also gonna make it a heck of a lot easier to manage these as well. So I'm gonna add a new Razor component in here and I'm gonna call this a uh, I'm going to call this a water a water mall waterfall message and I want you on this side yeah yeah I'm not injecting but it's going to be a parameter on this Right, and the, the model that we're receiving here is this content object. That content object is what's being shipped out of the SignalR hub. It's a content model, and a content model, we're gonna need to bring this over with us. Okay. 
There it is up there in data. We're also going to need the con the moderation. I'm just going to copy those. Drop into data here and add those. Uh, no. No. Um, that's not going to work. We need a class library. Tags app, let's call this, I want to call it view models. Let's call it that. I'm gonna stick with it. Delete this. Yes, thanks so much. Because we need it both on the SignalR hub and we need it in the in the um, and in the Blazor component. So we're going to adjust these. It doesn't know what cards and emotes are. They don't even know what the common objects are. Uh, boy. All right. That common project's gonna need to bust up a little bit too. Good. Um, so what I should be able to do Because this is, the view models are going to be shared between the server and the client, the Blazor server and the Blazor client. So it knows how to pass data back and forth between them. And importantly, so that our message, no, um, is going to contain a view models data content model. I just told you what that was. Yeah. No, I'm not missing it. I just, I just added that. I added that reference. So go ahead and rebuild. See what we get here. That. Doesn't know what view models is. How does that? I just added it. View models does not exist. I, I, I just stand by. It's right here. All right, so that all rebuilt properly. All right, so 
those are moved over and eventually I'll have the signal R hub able to push those through next tags app dot blazer dot view models maybe we'll get there we'll get there so I'm gonna take the JavaScript so formatting a message is an article. Has a bunch of CSS classes on it. Um, I don't know what all is going to be on it, but there's going to be something on it. No. Um, thank you. Let's make this clear. All right. Um, data URL, data provider, data provider ID. Let's create some strings for those. Do I create strings? Actually, I've got the content sitting here. I don't need to create those attributes. Like, I know what those are. I could probably create data timestamp. Do I need to create data yeah, yeah, we got it. But tagsapp.blazer might make sense to put in the name of the view models assembly. Um, this might be important, but I'm not sure. Profile picture, yes. Profile picture. Um, source equals content, not source URI. Yep. And then there's an error handler in there too. And an alt as well. Um, so alt instead of doing all of that I can just say at content let's just put these on new lines cool So it doesn't have any images, image content. Yeah. Let's um let's give it something to start with here. Right? Because tagged content, it's gonna just start throwing content into there. So we're gonna have some sort of private is it an I enumerable? No. Um, let's make it a sorted list. Hmm. Yes. Oh, that's so good. I like that. Right? Uh, don't care about the modal for right now. You can hide. Um, but in here... That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, it's not content. No. Right, we called this a waterfall message. Waterfall massage. Right, not, 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 what was it? Water Malone? Right, no, waterfall massage. Hello, I have a waterfall massage for you, Mr. Prince. 
Um, so let's let's give it a, a message to, to start with here that we can tinker with. Uh, uninitialized async, right? Like, right? And let's give it... No. Um, sure. Uh, let's say uh, date time... Now, sure. Thank you. Um, we'll see about that. It's text, not content. should be provider ID. Let's make this um, Twitter. It's source URI. Those aren't quite right. Sure. We're still missing... Sure, generate one for me. I thought it was a URI. No. Uh, whatever. I, I don't care, I'm just creating some test data here so that it renders. You know what I mean? Um... What else are we missing? Um, is it type? Yeah. Something like that? Why aren't you... Now, why isn't it like these? Oh. Well, well, well. It's a record. That's why. Something like this. No, it's not it's not letting me see the record signature. So that's annoying. Not gonna lie, that's a that's a bit annoying. Provider ID. Right. Uh, type. Oh, well, the hang on. The provider should be first, then provider ID. Type. Source URI. Right? I pasted that. Okay. Uh, Timestamp as a date time offset. Fine. Continuing. Author display name. I'll take you. Uh, author username. 
Okay, author profile URI. Right, uh, profile image URI. Text. Right, I, and I'm just setting up test data, so I'm not. Uh, null for the card. And uh, empty collection for that. Delete all of that. So that's the end of that. That's the end of the add statement. That's the end of on initialize. I don't, wrong ones there. That, when I say format, you should move that thing over too. How are we doing? Yes, you can restart, go ahead. I think we got it. So we'll see our first card up here. Right. All right. It's wrong, but all right, we're getting there. Right. Um. Okay. So, right, we're just initializing with a a test card at this point. All right, I don't need the content model. So next we added a div for the byline in the message. Right, so right now it just shows the image. And you know what, I'm just gonna copy this. So, uh, yeah. Uh, right, so I'll delete that. And we should be able to say at content author display name, whether or not it was auto modded, and we'll do something with that in the future. Uh, yep. We need one more closing div. All right, so I've got test user and there's an extra bracket there. There we go. We're getting there. Okay. Um, next is the provider. Right. So there is a map provider to icon method that we wrote. I might be able to use that directly. So now we're converting a JavaScript method to a C sharp method that'll run only in this component. Um, private string, can we make this static even? So trim and now I need to convert these right to C sharp strings. Wait a minute. Switch expression. Um. 
Hang on. There we go. Okay. So it it was pretty close. I like that. Done. Oh my gosh, that's so easy to read. Yes, we're <clears throat> we're migrating the app to Blazor. So now instead of that syntax, we can do like that. Change you to a <coughs> And let that run, and yes, it does have the Twitter X. Okay, still got more content to add. We need to add the time. And if there was an auto mod reason. Oh, boy. All right. So let's get this formatted. So this was doing a two locale string, and it was important to do this in the browser so that we got your locale that you like in the browser. Right? Because you have your browser configured appropriately to do those things. I think we want to do this with a little bit of JavaScript so that it does still work and, and use the two locale string formatting coming out of the browser. So, what if, hang on, <laughs> what if I just did, right, timestamp, Can I do... No. Can I do that? It's not visible yet. And then we need to add the content. The actual content itself. Um... We'll figure that out in just a minute. Give me... Just give me the text. Hmm. This is because... Ah! This is because masonry isn't loaded. So... Masonry. Before I get into preview card and any of the other stuff there, and that stuff can go away. Um, the masonry JavaScript is a layout. Is a bit of layout being done. That resizes all the grid items. This, I think we need to bring over directly and use. No, I didn't want it in lib. I wanted it. Yeah, I know. Add a folder. Don't need floating header. Goodbye. Yep, that's right. Okay. Um, up in App Razor, I need to add. Okay. So what this does is it it properly sizes the grid, so that we get that nice masonry layout for the waterfall. Sure. Um, 
So on the original waterfall page, after it starts, it's after it starts up listening. It says window on load, resize all grid items, and on resize, resize all grid items. So I'm going to bring them over into here. I can do this with script segments. I don't even need to inject because the waterfall layout has a script outlet. Right? Uh, hey there, Navir Box. Welcome. Section name equals scripts. Right, and I, can I just do that directly? Yes! <laughs> Woo! This is my fight song. Take back my life. All right. Have I come across any struggles moving from Razor Pages to Blazer? Oh, yes. Um, what do you mean if the user configured the browser appropriately? Oh, for their time zone. You don't even have to configure the browser. It'll pick up and use, right? And I, gosh, I don't want it to, do I need to show the, I, I'd like to show just a two digit year, you know? Uh, that's in the message. So I did it with a, with D here. Let's go look up time formatting. Mm -hmm. Not custom, I want the standard ones. Standard. Short date pattern, I want two digit years. G will get me, I want two digit years, man. Am I gonna have to make up my own format here? I don't wanna, I don't, I don't wanna. Hmm. I want to specify two digit years, man. Fine. <clears throat> What's the short time format? Sortable date time, short time. Lowercase t. getting somewhere, right? Um, I think that's okay. Yeah, I think we're all right with that. So the big struggles that I'm coming across are deciding where to place things so I can't put things that I want to pivot between interactivity models in a layout it must be a page or a component a layout needs to be pretty well static the, the layout 
can reference components that choose their interactivity model. And that's okay. Um, so, um, okay, so what else do we, what else do we have inside the message? So we have the preview card, if there is one. Um, and then there's the click and open up the modal interaction, right? There's an on click on, on this. And it turns it into that, that jQuery modal dialogue. But I'm not going to turn this into a jQuery modal dialogue. I'm going to turn this into a Blazor modal dialogue. Now, I, I could get a component library to do this for me. But I don't want to. Um, this is... This alone is pretty exciting to get it to this model. Right? And we'll figure out the whole pause operation. Um... Right, and if I if I go over here, we change that from Twitter, and we say Mastodon. Did I not save it? I saved it. Uh, really? And now I feel shame. Uh, why didn't it pick up Mastodon? And why didn't it do the resize? Um... I mean, I think there is a masonry resize that needs to happen. Not the layout. size grid item and the node that it just rendered. So I do need That's the That's where it's in uh, interactive auto. All right, so let's inject the JavaScript runtime. Sure. Right, JS runtime. Uh, invoke void async, yeah. And we're gonna await this. And this is going to be the wait. JavaScript interrupt calls cannot be done right because it's on after render. Mm. It needs to be the async one. Uh, async task. gonna take you it's 
Still building? Yes! <laughs> okay. Now, there's going to be an event that we're going to listen for coming off that signal or hub that we're going to render those and we're going to push them into the user interface. And when we push them in, we're going to want to resize the new items that are added. That really takes a long time to load. That delay is awful. I'm not angry with it, but it's awful. Charles! Charles Gilligley just resubscribed for 40 months. How you doing, Charles? Thank you so much for 40 months with us, and I'll make another donation to the American Cancer Society. Thank you so much for that support. Um, hang on. Um, I have this in the client, but I have the other masonry configuration stuff. on the server and it I don't think it's calling this one no it's not Is it even rendering that? There's masonry. It's not rendering that. Well, but look, script content. It... Yuck. I thought, I guess I'm wrong. Am I missing, there's a... Section outlet. Section content. Still does that weird. Did it even call the... Did call resize all. Um, yeah, there's a delay in the rendering. Like, okay. If I comment that one out, see, it never calls. The one that's actually embedded on the page, it never calls. So...
If I move that over here, right, and this is going to want a using statement. No. Just to be safe, let's reload. Let's take these then. Oh, come on. I don't need to say on load, it is on loaded. And we'll await JS runtime. Invoke void async. And I'll change these to single quotes. That should be invoke void. Rebuild that thing. Now. I don't think it executed that at all. Because we should have seen resize all pop up and we didn't. If I take it to that one, ooh, line eighty-five, and it's not giving me with the exception. Uh, ooh, e. Could not find window masonry resize all grid items. Um, got to get rid of that. I see. Okay, did that, how was that rendering? Eh, it's still kind of, Ugh! now I've, now I've angered it. Oh, wow. Yeah, look at that. Who dat? got messages popping up all over the place on Discord.
I have no idea what that was. Like, seriously. How the heck am I supposed to find anything? Uh... Oh boy. Okay. Okay. Uh, not a problem at all. I completely understand, and you do what you gotta do. Yeah, it was. You're right, coding gorilla. It was the double parens there. Um, setting detailed errors true in or set so detailed errors true in app settings development JSON. Okay. App settings development JSON. Like that. I thought I just did. Um, wait, argument two, what? Argument two is not an object on the add event listener. Right. Okay, that actually kind of makes sense. Here. It wants that to be an object. Um, which is window.masonry. Can I do that? Okay, hot reload succeeded, yeah. Still doesn't like it. Why is it dropping all this stuff? Argument two is not an object. So how do I make it a... Like, do I pass it like that? No, it still doesn't like it. Argument two is not an object. In the interest of science, do it again. No. <laughs> um, so... I mean, I, I could go into masonry and just say, um, uh, set up page. Size all grid items and then hey yeah just like that right so then I can actually take this down to window masonry setup page No, still doesn't like that. Uh, 
Uh, invoke void after render, get error handler task. Uh, resize all grid items is not defined. What? It's right there. Do I have to put a this on it? Uh, and I'm noticing that the scroll was not correct. How, how did we do over here this time? Hey, clear this, John. Hang on. Rerun it. Let's take a look. Yeek. Failed to load a configuration. Could not parse JSON value. What? Resized. Resize all grid items is not defined. Really? Doesn't like that either. Ooh, look at that stack. Right there, resize all grid items. Do I have to make this window dot masonry? Is that the one that it's not a? Masonry JS line 33. This one. Okay, that looks like it worked. Still clunky. Um, any reason why I'm not rewriting this in Blazor? Because I can't. This is resizing elements. I'm, I'm going through and I'm manipulating the DOM. So, I can't. Right? Th this is looking at all of the elements. If I were to rewrite this in Blazor, I, I'm going to run into an issue getting computed styles. I can't do that. Any window dot is not available to you in in Blazor. Can't I, I I've got to hand that off somewhere. At the very least, that needs to be um, that needs to be coming in from JavaScript. Even if I got that from JavaScript, right? Um, each one of the items is, is looking at the bounding client rectang re rectangle. And that property isn't available to me in C Sharp. That's a DOM thing. So I'm, I'm re it, this resizes items in the DOM. I can't do that in Blazor. So it would be nice to, but you can't you can't touch it. Um, that said, I think I have that as good as it's going to get. Right. 
I mean, that rendered and painted very, very quickly. So, um, there's still more work to do in there as far as getting the card working. Um, and, and getting the click through to show the, um, and there's also filtering that we've, we've got to bring into this that we're not quite at yet. But I feel pretty good about getting those couple pieces working. So let's put a commit in here. Now this says it's in the Yeah, I don't want these two here. It's rebuilding. Yeah, still looks good. Uh, blazer plant. Tags app laser. Um, the painting the first test message on the waterfall. Awesome. Valuable skill to get JavaScript working with Blazor. Totally agreed, Pac-Man Jr. Totally agreed. Um, and right, and to Nitro Evil's point, um, what we're learning as we're going through this process, we're learning the boundary points between JavaScript, WebAssembly, server interactive render mode, and server streaming, those boundary points and what we can and cannot push into each of those rendering capabilities is huge, right? This is being rendered with WebAssembly, right? Um, it's it's actually some server side bits that are loading WebAssembly components and painting them on the screen, um, right? That's all um, this page is static server-side rendered. And then, there we go. So, I'm okay with those. And in the masonry bit, right, there is a resize on a specific item that goes and looks at exactly which Right, and you have you have to pass into it that object. This is going to be an interesting bit. I wonder. What if we put the call to resize grid item in the waterfall message? one after render, right? What if we did that? Right, and we inject uh, IJS runtime. I'd really like the suggestions here. Um, so now down here, uh, we need a ref to this, right? Uh, let's call it this article. Yep. Uh, no, I don't want it. I don't want an event handler. This is in HTML reference. No. Sheep. What's the reference? Right? When you do at ref. What 
what is the variable type this should point to? Element reference, is that it? Yeah, there it is. Finally got back to it, but I've got Steve helping us. Hey, Destic, why am I migrating? Because I I want to be able to package and deliver this in several different formats. By going to Blazor, I'm going to be able to manipulate and move that a heck of a lot easier. Plus, I'm going to be able to render content even better on the client because I'm going to load all the client rendering in with WebAssembly and it's going to start up very, very quickly with a new Blazor and paint that. Um, so what I should be able to do here now is uh, write JS, JS runtime. Uh, oh, what were you? Come on, man. No. Close. No. Um... I want to do resize grid item. This article. If I do that instead, right? Then inside here, no, not inside there. Inside here, I don't need to call that. Yeah, you can, no, this one over here. I don't really need this today. Close that one. Yeah. Right, so each one of these, that look better. Each one of them now knows how to resize themselves. So I don't need to call this one here. Yep, it's doing a server rebuild. Okay. Back over to here. Back into there. Nice. I like that a lot better. Yeah, you don't know where that is. Uh, moved resize grid item to the waterfall message. Waterfall massage. Cool. Okay. So that kind of makes sense. I like it. Um, moving on. I hope once migration is complete, I hope it shines and shows the power of Blazor. Totally agree. Right? No pressure. <laughs> um, don't. All right. Um, next steps, right? I can wire up SignalR to actually start delivering these. I can. I should. I need to. We can, we can do it. Timmy, connect. Hello. Welcome in, Timmy. Um... I also need to make the uh, on-click open the modal dialog. I need to make that work. Which way should I go? Um, the modal dialog. It's sitting right here. And I feel like... I feel like that content modal should probably be its own component. So we just pass in content and it knows how to render itself. Right? Yeah. So let's take this, John. I love it. I said, John, move to a new file. Where'd it go? I don't think it did anything. Uh, 
Don't care about you right now. Don't care about you. Uh, yeah, down in here is where we need this. So let's do Control Shift A. We're gonna create a modal dialog. Waterfall modal. Because it's gonna be different in other places. Uh, dot resor. Resor? Did I try HTMX with Blazor? Nope. Nope. We're gonna receive a parameter. Parameter? Yep. Yeah. Uh, this is gonna be a content model. That's right. That's right, right there. Um, and then we're gonna fill out all the rest of this stuff. We probably, so for the back of the modal, ooh, this is where we picked up the style with the picture picture last time. Why, why should I try HTMX with Blazor? Does Restream post to YouTube? Sure does. Sure does. HTMX I see, I, I, I perceive as the fad color of the week attempt by folks that are in Go and Rust to get um, ASP.NET and Razor-like formatting. So why would I use HTMX? When it does a lot of the same stuff. Honest, un Honestly, I, I'm looking for help with that answer. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. So we could push, right? We could inject application configuration. I don't think it knows what that is. I don't think, no, it doesn't know what it is yet. Um, spoilers, we'll get there later. Yep, so if you check out the the YouTube channel, you can see the Restream bot is posting messages over there from the folks on Twitch. So, and about a half hour after I'm done streaming, the YouTube music troll will mark most of the music that we've been listening to here on stream as copyright them. What's really interesting is they manage copyrights for like universal music in a lot of the South American countries. So like they claim they own all music is what they're doing. Um, let me see. So here we want to do right. If we want this to look, I don't need to go through it too, too much right now. The footer fade. Where'd it go? It, it was right in here. So we could say like, uh, no. If dis display modal, Yes. Oh, it's so good. So good. Right? Uh, bool display modal equals false. Uh, yep. I think we can get rid of some of that. It didn't put that using anywhere. You didn't put that using anywhere. You should feel shame. Da, 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 da. Using tag zap, view models, data. Thank you, now you know what that is. Now you know what that is. Where is it? I have the sound effect for this. I know I have it. Mm. 
No. There it is. Now you know what that is. Now you know. And knowing is half the battle. Uh, you would think YouTube would blacklist uh, trolls that loose DMCA things. I get the exact same claim on every one of my streams from the exact same person, and they don't fight it at all. So at some point, they need to just drop it. Sorry, your claims are no longer valid. Um, hey, Eric, do I have a list of streams where I've worked on Tags app? Take a look back. They're, they're all on YouTube. Not all. A lot of them are on YouTube. The recent ones where I've been co-streaming. Syndication. They're out there. Why doesn't it like this? Waterfall modal. Uh, what do you mean you don't know what that is? Waterfall modal. It's in the client project. It's right there. Okay. Um, and, um, and Eric, um, I want to record a video where I introduce Tag Zap and I talk about what it is and get everybody up to speed and then record like a weekly update on here's what we've accomplished this week. And here's what's, what's new and interesting about it for just a five minute update video once a week that covers here's what we've accomplished because it, folks aren't tuning in and, and sitting and paying attention to YouTube replays that are right 15 hours of content over the course of a week it's just not happening um okay so that looks like it's rendering properly here so if i were to go through this then right and is it showing them it's not showing the mastodon logo why isn't it showing the mastodon logo Right? It's supposed to be like right there. It didn't to lower it. What? Wonderful message. BI. Uh, fine. To lower invariant trim. Ah, there it is. Um, so, right, we could change that to YouTube. All right, I saved that. There it is, YouTube. Um, yeah, let's leave it as Mastodon. There it goes. Okay. That user image, that is, that is on the server, okay. All right, we still have more to work on in here. Um, but it was all I want to make on click of this object pop the modal. So let's set that up as a parameter. Public event callback. Uh, yeah, content model. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, I put that on the wrong object. I want it on the message. Right? Mm. Um, content. Uh, wait, I want a uh, invoke async. Ooh. Try that again. Still doesn't like it. Rebuilding, there we go.
There we go. All right. So that event handler doesn't go anywhere yet. So inside waterfall. Right, we can say on content selected, uh, show modal. And I can generate, come on, you're not gonna generate the thing for me. You make me sad. Um, I'll make it an async task, show modal that takes a content model content. Right. Um, oh. Yes. No. Better. Um, did it do anything? I don't think it did anything. You want to see how this project started? Oh, um, I do have the video where I started it. Click, and did it actually add the component? Div, main, header, tag, content, footer, fade, content modal. And it's got the appropriate classes on it. I do have, so Eric, I do have the video from when I started. Maybe I should start out with just a cut down of that video. Um, hmm. Well, it is going on the page. These are jQuery things to format. Place it and do all that stuff. I could include it and then fire off the jQuery interactions to it. Right? Because where is it? Modal window dot modal. Bootstrap.modal right there. And there it's configuring all the things. And then saying show. But I'm already going to configure it with content from the... I'm already going to configure it with content from Blazor. So really, I need to say bootstrap new bootstrap modal, and then modal show, and then do the flip. If I want to take advantage of that bootstrap modal capability. Hmm. Right, if I take if I take these two off. Right. It's right there. Take that content. Uh take this off also.
It's right there. It's right there off the bottom of the page. But if we take advantage of, of the bootstrap, it'll load it appropriately. Have I ever used the dialogue HTML tag? I have not. Is there something we're missing that we should be using there? That is an ugly dialogue. I'd like to create a modal dialogue, yeah. doesn't give us a nice header so we'd, we would need to build that fancy but no Yeah, part of me thinks <clears throat> keep using the bootstrap one. But I need to activate the bootstrap JavaScript to run it. And that way I can continue to use that JavaScript component. Which means that this configuration to pop the dialogue which I'm doing all this configuration for in here right and then finally show and and do the flip I need to move that into some script not terrible Yeah, I've already got I've already got a bit of that there. Um I'm okay with adding just a little bit of script to do something of this. Modal dialogue component with bootstrap. Um, <laughs> that's very similar. Yeah. That's very similar to exactly what we want to do. I was just going to hand it all off. When I tried to use section content, it's being rendered before any script tags. Yeah, I had the wrong syntax there. It's rendering properly now. Yeah.
Easy dialogue management for Blazer. Um... Not bad. But see, I've already got this the the spin animation built in. That we, we spend a bit of time working on. Um And I'm noticing that that, so this example on Steve Giesel's website, I hope I pronounced his name right, um, doesn't have any JavaScript. It's just wiring directly up to um, the various bootstrap classes. So modal, modal class, Right, and he's got open and close interactions there for this. And he's just... So, I've already... Maybe I can get away without needing a site.js. I've already got a waterfall modal, right, set up here. So if we were to do something similar, right... the modal class being passed in. Where, what's he doing with the title? Go ahead, click it. Yeah, he's put a title bar across the top. Let's, um, let's bring some of these in. And I don't need child content. I'm already managing all of that. So he says modal, modal class, which is either string empty or show. And he also has uh, if I put them to so tab index minus one. Yep, I've already got that. Um, oops, no, I did want roll dialog, but tab index we can get rid of. I, I just cleaned that up there, friend. Okay. The, <clears throat> excuse me, in the modal header, um, I don't have a modal header, but I do have the close button right there. Quite there yet because I don't I, I don't have the click operation um, if show backdrop yeah let's put that in right show backdrop yes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. did I Save? Didn't save yet. No. Uh, 
Didn't do anything. Feels bad, man. Uh, console. What do we got? Nothing. Still nothing. Mm-hmm. Rebuild that. Let's take a look. I were playing... I, I were. I was playing Killing Floor 2 last night, Mad World Gales. Yes, yes, yes. Um, we'll get back to that, Nitro Evil, I promise. That's... Is it putting the content on the page? Content modal, there it is. Class modal fade. Yeah. So it's not showing that yet. Why? Um, style display none. Standby. Do I need to call open on it? I do. And I need to reference the dialogue with a ref. Okay, we can do that. Um, so here... Um, let's just call it modal. I don't, I don't need to put the, is he wrapping? If I take that out and that, We don't have this. Hello, Ergenrod. Ergenrod just resubscribed for 27 months. Hello, hello. 27 months. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll make a donation to the American Cancer Society. Thank you so much for that support. Um, this requires content to be passed in. Let's take that off. Um, waterfall modal. I should be able to say modal dot content equals content, and then modal dot open. Rebuilding, come on. Show me that thing works. Okay. Nothing. Nothing over there. Nothing over here. Hmm. Let's close and reopen Waterfall Razor. Still doesn't like it. It's it's sitting right next to you. It's right there. Make sure we're getting content passed all the way through. Oh. Okay, that says it's trying to show the modal. 
Um, do I need to do that? There we go. Um, I haven't, I haven't hit, and it's my close button isn't here, and I need to be able to click the background also. Um, oh, let's do this. Uh, at on click equals close. Well, that didn't work. Mm -hmm. Nope, clicking the background is not closing. Um, I did need some JavaScript for the masonry, for the layout. Um, uh, yeah, closing modal. Rebuild that, show me, show me. Yep, there it is. And then clicking in the background isn't closing it. There's the modal developer, backdrop. Developer, 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 um, Hello, thank you for joining us. Uh, so why isn't it letting me on click close that? Yes, it does. It's absolutely there. Why aren't you letting me set it? the render mode it's it's it needs to be rendered as as client side right <clears throat> the message pick up and render it whichever way and actually right yeah it won't interactive web assembly Message. 
Well, <clears throat> let it run with auto mode. Good. And the waterfall modal. Right. Okay. Because they're hosted inside of here where we've turned on auto. It's deciding for us. So we can't pop things out lower down the stack. Okay. So that does work, but I can't click in the background. And it's not picking up. Right, so we called modal open. And we're trying to put an on click to close. It's not picking that up. Why isn't it picking that up? Um, none of this content in here is, is it showing at all. And it's also not doing it, it's on it's on the backwards. It's showing the back. I need to make it spin. Here's another place where I need a little bit of JavaScript because I'm I'm going to mod well no modal inner flip um intermodal CSS class. Yeah, we can do this. Um, uh, we'll see in a second. Rebuilding, there we go, click. Didn't flip, maybe it did. Back, um, there it worked. Um, and after close,
Yeah, it's not flipping. Right? And this is... Here... Yeah, see, it's supposed to put that on, which does that. Um, if we just do... Building, bah, 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 bah. would it work with an escape key? Gonna have to figure that out also. There it goes. Close. All right. Not perfect, but we're getting there. An escape key. Um. We're gonna need an on key press. The, the article that we're learning from here doesn't have I don't think handles an escape This is very, very much a, a I mean, I, I, I can dodge out of this and say, well, it, it's, it's particularly for the zoom in effect of this. And we don't really need an escape key. Uh, we should. If I put in on key press, let's put it on key up. Oh, come on, generate it. Fine, be that way. Uh, public async task handle key press and it's like key press event args yeah is that what you're looking at can I convert from method group to callback Um, yeah, the div doesn't have a key up. Keyboard event arcs. Well, okay. I have to click into it to get... Um, I could put, I could force focus on this, right? Uh, I'm not familiar with focus manager. Is that a thing?
No. What do we got from our friends at Sync Fusion? No, clicking outside does close. Um, well, no, clicking outside doesn't close. Yeah. So there's, that is still not a thing. But I can get it to close. Haven't the the event callback? It, it's it's not attempting to call close. Um. No doubt that it's going to work, but I thought there was something built in now. Blazer focus element. So he's got a ref to that element and calling focus async. item ref outer modal modal thank you Now it's not even clicking. It's saying showing modal and it's not finding it. Which... Okay, clicking outside isn't doing anything. But once I am clicked on the outside, I am able to escape. Uh, 
Uh, oops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I thought. It... What did I do? That should be like an await. I don't think it actually... Let's see what we get. A div may need a style to set pointer events to none to allow the click through. Escape works, right? That's me escaping. Can't click on the background and exit. All right, hang on. I That put me on content modal. not the backdrop. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny, random piece. Uh, warm piece. Um... Yeah, that works. So, clicking out here is content modal. If I put the on click, I don't know why it's highlighting everything as bad there. not the right one. If I do that... I was able to click outside and it does close, but it's also going to close if I click anywhere inside too. Hey, Amazdrin, welcome. Um, yeah, I don't want to necessarily. But it is kind of important to be able to click anywhere in the background. Oh, now I've done it. I think I got caught there between hot reloads. Think. Let's see what we get. There it is. So clicking in the background. And what is it? The pointer events? Were pointer events none? What was it you were saying?
No, it's not on dot modal. Modal backdrop. And it's not picking it up. It it is a modal you should have to dismiss, but there's also the if you click outside of it, it dismisses it. I mean, I can run with what we've got for right now and just mark that as an issue to come back to at some point. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Oh. No, it's not the modal content. It's the backdrop. That's Carl. That's Carl. Um, okay. So, if I move past this for right now and I just load up the content appropriately for that modal, um, ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba -ba. yeah, I, I know most of this stuff. Profile picture is going to be content, author profile URI. Alt is uh, author display name. Uh, content. Author display name. Author username. And here we are back in, I should be able to say, Waterfall message. No. Content provider. Close button and then the time. We decided is going to be like this. And then the modal body for right now. That's a lot of errors. Because the value isn't set yet. Right, these aren't a thing yet. Rebuild. Map provider to icon. Take a look at the bootstrap icons and find a good default. 
<clears throat> if there isn't anything there. Uh, here we go. Uh, how about just a question mark? Question circle. That works for me. I broke it. Yeesh. That's not right. Close. That's not right. It's in the wrong place. It's not supposed to be inside. That's better. There we go. Nice. Yeah, the idea is that if you're using this on a big touch screen, you need to be able to touch outside and the escape button doesn't work there, but you have this large touch zone to dismiss outside of it that you want to be able to click into. And it doesn't work. Uh, put a big old to do in here. Uh, need to allow closing of the dialogue by clicking outside of it. How should we do that? You don't know, do you? Yeah, there's a, it, it's hiding somewhere that's capturing those events. Right, and if I click on the outside, I get the entire content modal. I, I'm, I'm getting... And if I put the on click on that, it doesn't matter where you click on this. Right, refresh click and I can click anywhere I click outside here that works but also if I click inside so we don't necessarily want that so how can I prevent that from bubbling blazer click event Right, because I want to cancel it. On click event stop propagation. Really? Really? Um, there's too many things going across here. Let's. Build that just looks weird. Clicking outside works. Eh. Stop propagation didn't do anything. Just 
adjust the CSS to allow the click through of that div that's capturing it and maybe prevent clicks in the main model content. Yeah, look, I don't want it. I don't want you to be able to select inside there. Um, what does the bootstrap modal do? Maybe there's, we can just, instead of trying to hunt around here, That's all CSS. Go to the website. See what it does. then prevent default. So one click close. That's not working anyway. Right. That's working everywhere on that. But if I go in here and say at on click, okay, that works. I clicked outside of it. That works. And if I click the X box, that works also. The X icon. Yeah, I think we got it. Because I, I had to move the on click to there. Um, I want to also do the prevent... Uh, right, so laser prevent text selection. Right, because that's a that's a problem. Yeah, the Xbox. <laughs> uh, user select none. So why doesn't that have it? Whatever. Yep, style equals user select none. I'd really prefer that to be. Yeah, I can, now I can't select. And I also don't want to be able to select on that either. So let's do this. Let's 
let's just say modal inner. Right? No. Do that. And also on each one of the uh, cards. That way you can't inadvertently select content on the card. There we go. That's better. I don't need Site.js. I started adding that and we don't need it. So we've been able to do a lot of this without any. Uh, and then we can ditch the to-do in the modal. Yep, because we got that working. Uh, and then... Completed uh, initial uh, waterfall modal. Um, we still have to load the image, get the image set up there. So, um, right for the, what appears on the back of the card. But that's that's pretty good. I'd, I'd really... This is saying interactive server. And then it puts the waterfall on there. So I, I don't need the cascading value now because it's right there. So I can get rid of this. Can I bring the waterfall modal here instead of inside of? Um, it's going to need to know, let's bubble that up further. This is interactive auto. If I put waterfall modal, if I put it directly inside here, I can force it to be a web assembly component. Leave it the way it is, where it's interactive auto. So the page starts up in its server side. It's going to jump into the waterfall. This is interactive auto. So it's going to try and paint it from the web server. And once it's done doing that, and it's it's loaded, it's web assembly at this point. And I'm, all that content is sitting, and it's just passing the data back and forth. And this is server. So, and now I'm on a static page. Nice. Option to make what bigger or smaller? The dialogue? 
come back to that. Let me get parity with the current features before we before we do that. Do me a favor, open an issue in the repository for that. I'm game to to address that, sure. Um Okay. I don't want to wire up the pause button yet, and quite frankly, the pause button should be its own right. Where is it? Right there. That should be its own component as well. Same thing here again. Yeah, there we go. So that has its own little CSS wired up, and I could probably. Right, let's wire it up to its own component there. Wrong one. There we go. Pause button, razor, CSS. looking at the pause updates and that's what it's applying to. Um, I think we're good with it like that, right? Whoop, it's gone. <laughs> hey, homeless rogue. We'll, we will be able to put better event handling and capturing in here for managing the state of that. Um, because the way it's done right now, oh dear lord, it's a spaghetti's nest. It's a it's a bird's nest. It's a ball of spaghetti. It's ugly. Um, but that was on here. Yeah, and it's saying, I don't know where that is. Um, if I close that and reopen it. Still doesn't know where it is. No. It's right here. Tags app blazer client components. Shouldn't even need to include it because it's in the same folder. You know what I mean? Like, let me put it to you this way. The stuff that's actually building and using it found it. Yeah, it's an Intel. I think you're right. It's an IntelliSense bug. Homeless rug. Yeah. Um. So, and, and we'll make this click and disable and wire up those events. Yeah. Right, because this is, this is where we're going to be receiving and handling the data loading and putting in, pushing in messages. 
Um, one of the features that, that we had hanging out there that we wanted to do for a long time was being able to um, visually animate new messages arriving. Oh, and there's all these reports that I want to be able to do on this too. They're going to be great. Cool. Thank you, Marcus. Yeah, that type of feedback I'm way on board for, but there's a, the bigger task of getting feature parity running again that we'll get to and, and definitely get back around to that and address it. Thank you. Um, and I like that you use the, uh, the, the guess emote there. <laughs> All right. Um, so the pause button is there, but it doesn't do anything yet. I know how to load and paint messages on the screen. Do we start wiring up? So I use Signal R to do the first fetch of data. Mm. Hey, welcome in. Is it? Let me make sure I pronounce your name right and, and correct me here. Is it Iman Tao? Iman Tao? Let me know. Welcome. It's good to have you joining us. Um. Thinking. Type of neutrino. Oh, cool. I learned something new. Um, let's see. Where are we going here? Just. What is that? Oh, yeah. We're good on that. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Mm -hmm. No. Um, <laughs> just making sure I don't miss anything. No, I'm okay. Good. Good, good, good. Holy smokes. What happened over here? Okay. Um, <laughs> thinking. What's the next thing I'll tackle? That's the question. I think... Part of me says that the... Data loading is what we should go after next. Getting the data to load. The admin area would be good to attack also. Um, and the admin area, I want to render a static content with appropriate right permission checking on it. Mm, we don't really have areas, right? So I would more or less create a folder called admin and start putting some content in there. But I don't have any interactive data loading, fetching interaction yet. So what should we do next? Wait, I have a pages folder here and I didn't put any of that content into it. You, go in there. That should have continued to work, right? Or not. Um, feels bad, man. Did the floating header? 
Now it knows what that is. Now it knows what that content is. Nice. Am I using .NET 8? Sure am. Yep. That's good. Um, let's wire up some properties to the pause button. Right? Like... No. Uh, public bool is paused... set up a that's pretty good that's pretty good um and format pause button to say um, is paused if it is paused then we want play otherwise we want pause and we want an on click handler on this Event callback. There we go. There we go. So now uh, we're going to do um, pause clicked. Right, so void was clicked. And this is coming from somewhere outside, so we're going to want to do state as changed. On pause update, yes. So it pauses now. Doesn't know, doesn't have anything actually wired up to listen and do something with it, but it's got a thing. You're still on .NET 7 because a Firebird EF core driver is coming a few years back. Oh, that's annoying. That's really annoying. Um, okay, so I've got the pause button. At least it knows how to pause, raise an event about the pause. Um, it's it's going to pause for the cause. Um, and it's going to mark things as is paused. So the waterfall I thought we had you fixed. So let's do that. How do you not know what that is? Like, uh, 
Um, yeah, it's it's like it doesn't know what it is, but that sure does. Whatever. Restart Visual Studio. I could. I could. Wouldn't hurt. So, and we'll take a look at that. I should wrap up here in a little bit because I could use some lunch. Not going to lie. But man, we've gotten a, a bunch done here. Like, migrating this wasn't going to be easy. But we've got a bunch of pieces that are working. I think signal arm might be the next big piece we go after. You know? Doing the GitHub Copilot wire up there, yes. Beep, beep, honk, honk. And still doesn't know what pause button is. Now it does. Yeah, it's like something in the background isn't quite reading it properly. But that looks good. What do we got? Tags app, Blazor, client. Um, converted pause button to a component. Good. So the pause button will operate on the server until everything's downloaded WebAssembly and then it'll wire it up. Signal R and then after that, auth. I was thinking the admin area. Save auth. No, you're right, Redux. You're right. Lunch would be a good thing. Um, but this is... The, the componentized approach to this is making things a heck of a lot easier to manage here. Get rid of that other thing there. We don't need that. Um, what else? If I start adding in signal R, First off, I feel like I feel like the program here has so much stuff going on that I want to encapsulate and hide a lot of this. Um, because there's there's pieces here that are going to get completely ripped out and rewritten. Um, like right. This is all security right here. Move that somewhere else. Because this is going to get ugly. Uh, builder services add signal R. Don't mind if I do. And somewhere down here. Map, uh, map hubs, map hub, yes. And it was message hub, I think is what we called it in the other one, right? Hubs, I'm just gonna copy you completely and bring you right over here. How you doing? Yep, map the message up. Um, I don't know what you are yet, so I'm just going to comment that out. Okay. 
There's a whole lot of other things in here that it doesn't know what these are yet. Okay. Getting there. Can we just say hubs.message hub? No. Not going to get it for me? Pattern for the message hub was, because I probably want to stick to something similar. No, nah, it's not that one. Messages. This is going to be ugly. Not gonna lie, this is gonna be ugly. Right, so. I need to signal our client. Signal our context. Right. So uh sure, go ahead, declare it nullable. No. I know they're not going to be. I said content model like that. No. If I did it like that. out of moderation hub. Moderation hub isn't ready for us yet. This one. You aren't ready for us yet. I'm going to get the signal R context into this thing. So, Blazor signal R client. 
right? Yup. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Add the signal our client library. Don't mind if I do. It's going to be down in this John. It's going to be hub context. Yeah, whatever. Go away. Fancy. Yeah. It's a lot. All right. Next. Add a signal or hub. We've already got one. Add services and an endpoint. Or I already got one. Add response compression middleware services. Really? Oh, here comes the chat. Blah, 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 blah. Using Microsoft ASP.NET SignalR client. Do, 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 do. That's. Yeah, now what? Set up the hub connection and do the things. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do that for now. Sure, something like this and something like that. And something like that. Uh, let's just say start signal our hub so that we're not completely uh, we'll await that I'd really like to control dot but you're not going to give that to me are you fine oh my gosh are you flipping kidding me slash messages whatever um uh, sure maybe i also need to implement um i disposable now It's not dead is connection. Fine. Yeah. Let's just make a task. What don't you like about that? Is it value task? Thank you. Because it is not public. Fine. 
be that way. Unable to resolve service for type iMessaging service. Right. That's good. Because I didn't register that thing yet. Okay. But it knows how to get in there now. I like that. Um, also, after we start the hub, we should tell it just like we do over here in in the real waterfall page, the previous version. Um, so we tell it listen for waterfall content, but then there's a there's a fetch for that. Right here it is setting up the connection builder. New this, new that. Do that. Start. Configure the pause button. Get existing content for tag. And for the content that comes back, do these things. Oh, disable context menu. Don't forget to wire that up. Um, I'm going to take this and I'm going to throw it into the waterfall layout. I want it in here, but that's not going to work. There is actually in the masonry, right? We put setup page in here, right? That this knows how. Actually, we put it in the in the message, didn't we? Yeah. Um, we do need it to do the add event listener on resize. Let's go back like that. We do need uh, if now we need it. Oh, did I do that wrong? I might have. I, I might have done it wrong. Return that. I'm game with that. Yeah, that's right. It, it's... There's a lot going on on this side of the camera. Um, so over here... No. To make sure the connection isn't null before disposing it. I mean, sure, we can. Um... Uh, 
Thank you. I can do, I should be able to just do JS runtime invoke. Come on now. Uh, window masonry. And what was it like? Setup page. Yep. Um, you, you're not going to give it to me. Are you? Right. So that. Mm, it's okay. It's rebuilding, or it's not. It's just bailing. Here we go. Type or namespace signal R does not exist. I just added it, you fool. I, I added it. See, it's right there. Waterfall razor. client and if we do a dot net restore should find it because what do you mean it doesn't exist At the SignalR client library. Microsoft ASP.NET Core SignalR client. That's for the hub. Yeah, then on the page. Doesn't it like that? There's no marker on it. But there is over here. Microsoft ASP.NET Core Signal R Client, this one. I must have had something off there. I don't know what. Hey, Juan Van. Yeah, happy coding day to us. Right? Microsoft AS. Pnet Core, Signal our Client. Yeah, now we got no. What? Hmm. 
No. And... No, it's all there. Hmm. Clean and rebuild. Yep, I kind of agree. I, when in doubt, clean twice. Nope. No. Well, wait a sec, wait a sec. Hub connection could not be found on 32 here. Because it doesn't know what that is. No. I'm not even getting a control dot on this. Okay. Sure. Put that into here. It was just a app use response compression. Okay. No, we're not even getting there. Signal our laser client. Now. Nah. I would have gotten a conflict or a version downgrade up here. Right, and it doesn't know what that is, so yeah. I don't know what that is. And it's not even on the list. Tags app laser client dot net add package Microsoft ASP net core signal R client nothing to it. Contains more than one project. Uh, 
Where did that come from? That's pretty weird right there. There it is. There it is. Where the heck did that come from? Hey, Thindal. It, uh, yes, gremlins. I'm in the wrong folder, that's why. Tags at Blazer. We're doing well. How are you, my friend? And started. There's the website. And if I go to Waterfall, it's going to break. Because <coughs> it's trying to attach to a thing that isn't fully defined yet. We know that. So we're good with that. Because we haven't hooked up the data services yet. All right. I'm going to call it there because it's been it's been a long stream. Six hours together here. Let's go down here. Right. Whatever. I didn't think I changed anything in there. What did I change in Site.js? Oh my. Um. Started connecting signal R to the waterfall. So that cleaned up the pause buttons, CSS, a little bit. That's fine. Um, yes, we are moving tag zap to blazer. But I'm going to call it a day right there because man, oh man, did we get through a lot. Thursday, 24 hour stream. No, but we do, we will have a longer stream coming up here to be sure. Um, so you can take a look at my branch of this. If you go down into C sharp Fritz, I should probably, right? Initial connection to Blue Sky. Let's create that initial pull request. Starting Blazer. Let's just call it Blazer Migration. I, I'm clicking here. I'm clicking. Wow. Let's get rid of that. Okay. I don't I don't know what you're doing, GitHub, but I don't like it. Um we're gonna create this as a draft PR. Uh, no, where are you where are you going? Fixes Three, two, one. Create that as a draft PR. Yes, I, I know. That's why I'm clicking draft PR. So you can see everything that I've got going on here about the mid-transition story. No, it's not broken beyond recognition. No. We've been able to get some pieces working. And the waterfall page, particularly, is rendering 
um, the outside interactive server and the internal content of it is rendering in Blazor Auto mode. This way, you'll at least get initial an initial batch of content you'll be able to work with that is being rendered and delivered from the server. And on subsequent visits, after everything's synced, everything will run really fast with WebAssembly, presenting and loading on that on that WebAssembly page. A um, couple things that I want to I want to get to sooner than later. I already laid out a website locate a a new organization on uh, GitHub for TagZap. I put an entry for the, what will be the public website out here. Yes, invite some people and whatnot. I know, I know. Show me the projects. Um, right, so we'll have our our public website out here. We'll move TagZap out here and start breaking it apart into individual um, repositories for individual providers so that they get loaded and assembled later. And we'll even start setting up microservices and other plugins that we can deliver into other locations. But for now, it's time for me to call it a day. Because, man, did we do a lot. Oh. So much. Um, we, we got the waterfall page working, rendering a test message. We've got it connecting up now with SignalR. We've got it doing some formatting. We even got the dialog, the modal dialog, displaying properly. We moved the pause button out, so it's its own component now. It's really feeling more componentized instead of just a collection of JavaScript. 12, 1300 lines of JavaScript that just reaches into some HTML and does a bunch of stuff. Now it's getting more organized. Now it feels like something that we can reuse and move around. And we're, yes, totally. And because of that, it's getting easier to push content and say, this should run on the server, this should run on the client, and a mixture between the two. Let me see who else is streaming on the big Twitch TV network. Who can we get you connected to? Who's doing something fun? Those of you that are watching over on YouTube, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Check out all the great content down below, off to the side from, from the stream here for you to check out. There's great stuff out there. Um, looking through the list of folks here. Um, let me see. Who else can we get you connected to? Um, you know what? Let me, gosh, I'm not quite sure who to send you to. Um, no, uh, no, show me who I'm following. That's live. Thank you. Um, Let me get you sent over to. Let me get you sent over to. Uh, no, I, 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 I'm sorry. I do not like writing some rating somebody who's got thousands of viewers. It's, it doesn't help promote them. It doesn't. I, I want to promote and lift up other folks that have, uh, have some content that that needs to be spotlighted. Um. Let me head over. I'm going to raid Polarin. Um, they're, they're building and working on a project over there on their channel. Um, it says Multiplayer Pipe Dreams. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you have a fantastic day. Until I see you again, I'm going to try and be back streaming tomorrow. But until I see you again, I wish you good health and good coding. Take care.